Faculty of Medicine Universitas Airlangga can reach a great level in Asia and in the world. Great, thank you Arya. Good morning and good evening ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 99th Arlangga webinar conference series with the topic of brain and head neck tumor. My name is Kevin and along with my senior Dr. Ahmad Heriana, pediatrician, and my colleagues Dr. Sacharisa, Asyadila, and Arya, we are the organizing committee members of this morning and or evening webinar. This webinar is organized by the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, Surabaya. And before we proceed to the main event, we will announce some of the rules regarding the certification and Q&A session of this webinar. Firstly, the rules for certification. Full participation during the webinar is required. And your attendance will be recorded automatically by the Zoom application and the certificate will be sent to your registered email address. And by the end of this webinar, participants are required to fill a questionnaire, which the committee will send the link in the chat box. Next. Next is rules for Q&A session. You can use the Q&A box on the middle of your Zoom panel to write down your questions. Questions will be sorted and discussed after all lectures have been presented. Thank you for your participation and we sincerely hope you enjoy this morning webinars. And we will start this event with an opening remark from our beloved host, Dr. Widiana Ferias, the day radiologist to Dr. Widiana, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening and good morning in United States. To our, to our esteemed guests, the Honorable Head of Radiology Department, Dr. Dr. Rossi Setiawati, a radiologist consultant, the Honorable Chairperson of Radiology Department, Dr. Liz Madiana, radiologist consultant, and senior staff members and their resident, and last but not least, our best speaker, Professor Suresh Kumar Mukherjee, MD, MBA, FACR, Dr. Sri Andriani Utomo, Neuroradiologist, Head and Neck Consultant, Dr. Dr. Anggraini Dwi Sensusyati, Neuroradiologist, Head and Neck Consultant. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Brain and Head and Neck Tumor. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Vidyana, and it is an honor to be an honor to be the host in this webinar. And the agenda of this webinar consists of opening speech, presentation session by three speakers, case discussion session with three panelists, and take home message. Move on to first agenda. Here are the opening speech from the Honorable Head of Radiology Department, University Erlangga, Dr. Sutomo General Hospital, Dr. Dr. Rossi Setiawati, Radiologist Consultant. Please, time and uh, place and time is yours, Dr. Rossi. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vidiana, for the opening and introduction. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening in Indonesia and good morning in US. First of all, let us praise and thank the presence of Allah Almighty for the abundance and the grace and the joy of all of us can still gather in this meeting without any barriers at all in the good health. We are very glad to have our 99 Erlangga webinar conference series with topic of brain and the head and neck tumor. This webinar is supported by our Faculty of Medicine at Langa University, Surabaya, so that I would like to say uh, my appreciation and thanks to our Dean of Faculty of Medicine, 
our uh, chairman of the AWCS and all team who uh, organize and giving a full support to this uh, meeting. I would like to express my special welcome to our distinguished guest speaker tonight, uh, Professor Suresh Mukherjee, MD, MBA, FCR. Thank you for being our young professor of Department of Radiology in Faculty of Medicines at Langa University. And thank you so much for giving us the international exposure to our doctors and residents. And I believe this wonderful engagement could improve Indonesian educational program. And my special welcome and thanks to Dr. Sri Andriani and Dr. Angreni Dwi Sensuciati, a consultant of neuroradiology. And to our panelists, we have a professor of radiology from Brawijaya University, Malang Professor Dr. Yuyun Yuniwati. And we also have our vice dean of our faculty of medicine, Dr. Dr. Ahmad Kusnu Romdoni. And the last is Dr. Vihasto Suryaning Tias. He is a consultant of uh, neurosurgery. And uh, I hope that we will have an uh, interactive discussion at the last of this meeting. And on behalf of Radiology Department, Faculty of Medicine, Erlanga University, we hope this webinar could bring this positive impact for our multidiscipline teamwork, especially in neurology and head and neck area of fields, and could improve the health services for our patient better outcome. And thanks to the doctors, residents, and all participants who have taken, you have taken the time to attend this meeting. Without lingering longer, allow me to open this webinar. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rossi, for the opening speech. And on the presentation session, there will be three speakers. First, Professor Suresh Kumar Mukherjee, MD, MBA, FACR, from Faculty of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Michigan State University, USA. And the moderator will be Dr. Angraini. And the second is uh, Dr. Sri Andriani Utomo, a neuroradiologist consultant from Erlanga University. And I will be the moderator. And, uh, and then the, for the third presentation is by Dr. Dr. Angraini Dwisen Susiati, a neuroradiologist consultant from uh, University Erlanga. And the moderator will be Dr. Sri Andriani. Uh, so the first presentation will be conducted by Dr. Angraini. The place and time is yours, Dr. Angre. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidyana. Uh, yeah, welcome to the webinar series. Uh, for the first speakers, Professor Suresh Kumar Mukherjee will be uh, uh, present the anterior, anterior skull base pathology. And uh, before his presentation, I will read the CV, yeah, short CV. Professor Suresh Kumar Mukherjee, MD, MBA, FACR. He is clinical professor of radiology and radiation oncology, University of Illinois. Clinical professor of radiation oncology, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, Rutgers University. Faculty, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, Michigan State University. And national director of head and neck radiology, Proscan. Professor, you are uh, members of uh, organization, professional organization, also uh, societies and also awards, many awards. If I read, we uh, lost our time. So uh, it, it is a very a good time uh, for us to listen your lecture. And we are thank you that you are uh, our adjunct professor from last week. So uh, yeah, time is yours, professor. We have uh, one hour. So in, in the end, we'll discuss uh, cases. Thank you, time is yours now. <laughs> 
Great. Uh, thank you very much. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if this is going to work or not, uh, but uh, I um, I'm wearing a shirt that I was given when I visited Indonesia probably about four years ago. So for the inauguration, I wore one color. Now I'm wearing the second shirt. So I think Dr. DV gave me two shirts, if I recall. So I just want to let you know that I still have these. Um, I, uh, they're very important to me. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think you could see it very well because of the background, but this is the green one. So that you all yeah, gave it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In yeah. yeah, those are wonderful mementos because sometimes you get the plaques and we get so many plaques, they sort of go into a box. But the shirts <laughs> I wear, um, I wear them very frequently. So every time I see them there, they mean a lot to me. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and then also thank you for the honor of becoming an adjunct faculty at the university. I think it's a wonderful ceremony last week. Um, and just for the, as I mentioned before in my little opening remarks, uh, you know, relationships are so important. So I know we've gotten to know you all over the last uh, five, 10 years. And uh, I had a wonderful time visiting Jakarta and then to Bali. Um, but uh, it's uh, one thing about COVID did is that uh, it facilitated these types of interactions because you know, the globalization, the democratization of, of, of education, I don't think ever would have happened. So sometimes within every dark cloud, there's a silver lining. And, you know, sometimes if you stay positive in life, you'll always be able to, to take something away. So I think uh, our ability to do what we're doing right now was one of the real um, gems, uh, one of the few benefits that we've seen through the last uh, few years. So again, thank you for having me. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to interact like this. And again, thank you for the, the honor of becoming a, a faculty member um, at your university and your department. Uh, so over the next um, uh, uh, 60 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about anatomy and pathology of the anterior skull base. Um, and so the first thing that we'll do is that when we talk about the skull base, we'll first talk about the definition of the skull base. And so really the skull base is a very, very thin structure, but it's a very complex area in the sense that it really encompasses different bones that encompass the skull base. So the most anterior portion of the anterior skull base arises from the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. And I specifically want to mention this bone right here, which is the frontal bone, which is in purple. And then the posterior portion of the anterior skull base extends to this area here, which is just at the level of the anterior clinoid processes. Now, if you look closely, this bone right here in purple is the frontal bone. And then we have this area, which is in orange here. This is the cribriform bone or the cribriform plate, which is a different bone. And then we have this green bone right here, which we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about, which is the sphenoid bone. So when we look at the anterior skull base, it actually encompasses three different bones. And that's the frontal bone, the cribriform plate, and a portion of the sphenoid bone. So when we look at the anterior skull base, the bones itself are relatively thin. And when we actually look at tumors that arise from the bone, there are a few, but not that many that arise from the bone. Yet, as we'll see, there's a lot of pathology that can involve the anterior skull base. So one thing to remember as we begin our journey to discuss the anatomy and especially the pathology of the anterior skull base is that most of the lesions that involve the anterior skull base do not arise from the skull base. Rather, they arise from the adjacent structures. So what's really adjacent to the anterior skull base? Well, as you'll see, we have the paranasal sinuses, we have the orbits, we have lacrimal glands, we have forehead, et cetera. And all of this pathology that involves the anterior, that arises from adjacent to the anterior skull base um, will be in our differential diagnosis when we look at these lesions. So the second thing that we'll do is really the imaging anatomy. Now, the majority of us on this call are gonna be radiologists but I'm sure there are gonna be some people on the call that are non-radiologists. And oftentimes when we are interacting with our surgical colleagues or, or our radiation oncology colleagues, they'll oftentimes say, well, I have a patient that has this mass involving the anterior skull base. You know, which study should I get? Should I really get a CT or should I get an MR? Um, and unfortunately, or if I should say fortunately, it's always important to remember that these studies are really complementary. 
because on the left here is a, a CT scan that's reconstructed in bone algorithms. And we really can see the beautiful definition of the bone on the left. So the CT really gives us good assessment of the bone. But when we look at the MR, the MR is much better for the soft tissues and evaluate the intracranial contents. So when we look at the MR, especially on this T2-weighted MR, we can see that we see very nicely the olfactory nerves surrounded by this small little CSF cleft, which separates it from the gyrus rectus. So the MR gives us a very nice appreciation of the intracranial contents, and we'll see how that's important later. Similarly, if you are doing this, it, I, I always encourage you that if you are doing an MR for anterior skull base lesions, please de develop a dedicated anterior skull base MRI protocol. Because oftentimes you'll do an MR of the brain and the detail may not be sufficient enough to talk about some of the important structures that are gonna be involved. So in order to determine whether or not your resolution is good enough, you know, make sure you could always see the olfactory nerves clearly separated from the gyrus rectus muscle. So if you are seeing that nice separation, that tells you that you're in the right ballpark uh, regarding the quality of your imaging studies. So this is just an example of a, of a case of a patient that has a forehead squamous cell carcinoma. And the, it, this is a clinically obvious diagnosis. And when we look at the, the, the CT scan, we can see there's erosion of the outer cortex of the frontal bone. Now, if you look at the posterior cortex of the frontal bone, it actually looks like it looks intact and it, it is intact. And so I think, you know, oftentimes the surgeons can go in and say, well, I don't really need to get an MRI scan. Why? Because, well, I can, even though the outer cortex is eroded, I can see that the inner cortex it looks intact. But in this same patient, when we look at the MR, we can see that there is abnormal enhancement of the dura. And what this is, is either diffuse inflammation that's arising from this squamous cell carcinoma, or it's actually extension. Now, remember, tumors have a very robust inflammatory response. So when we see this on imaging, what this tells the surgeons is that, well, it could be tumor, but it also could be periturbal inflammation. And at the very least, the dura needs to be sampled because if this is dural involvement, then this has to be resected. If it's dural involvement by tumor, then this has to be resected and negatively affects the prognosis of the patient. So just realize that you, when you are dealing with this anterior skull base lesions, um, this involvement to the dura may occur and it may not be visualized just based on the CT alone. So let's base, begin our journey when we look at the anterior skull base. So what you'll see is that you'll see this red line here and this red line here, and these are going to uh, move and give us the different areas that we'll be discussing. So right now we're looking at the most anterior portion of the anterior skull base. So this area right here is the fovea ethmoidalis. This little groove right here is the nasolacrimal duct. And this is the most anterior portion of the ethmoid air cells, which is anterior to the, frontal, uh, the nasofrontal duct. And this is the agonazi air cell. When we look at the brain, we can just see the standard brain uh, convolutions of the frontal lobe. Now what happens is that we go, when we move a little bit more posteriorly, we now start to see some of the other anatomy involving the anterior skull base. So when we look at the anterior skull base, this is what we see. This is the fovea ethmoidalis. This area that's extending vertically is a lateral lamella. This area right here is our cribriform plate. This is the cristigalli. And if you look real closely, there's a little defect right here. There's a little groove in the lateral lamella. And that little groove corresponds to this artery. And this artery is the anterior ethmoid artery. Now, from a surgical standpoint, you can occasionally have patients present with nosebleeds. And the majority of the nosebleeds are going to be arising from the internal maxillary artery. So they can, we can actually embolize these arteries. But if there's intermittent bleeding, then this is oftentimes due to that anterior ethmoidal artery. So sometimes the surgeons will have to clip that artery. But from an anatomic standpoint, we always should be able to see that anterior ethmoidal artery. So look real, real close on your next time you do your sinus CTs. I'm sure you're doing them with thin sections, but you can see that little groove. And this is the brain MR, again, just demonstrating just the normal intracranial contents. Now, if we move a little bit further, now we can see the, again, we're starting to get a little bit of flattening here of the anterior skull base. We're at the level of the cribriform plate and the posterior aspect 
of the crystalgali. Now, when we look at the brain imaging, now we start to see the gyrus rectus and we can see the olfactory groove, excuse me, the olfactory nerve extending into the olfactory sulcus. Remember, the function of the olfactory nerve is that it runs along the floor of the anterior cranial fossa and above, runs above this perforated cribriform plate. So the cribriform plate has these small little holes in it. And what this cribriform plate does, it, arouse, it, it allows the ability of the small little neurofibrils that are, emanate from the olfactory nerve to extend through the anterior skull base to innervate the nasal cavity. So this is the real function of the cribriform plate. It allows these small little neural fibrils to actually pr provide sensory innervation to the nasal cavity. Now, once we go a little bit more posteriorly, we're now starting to run into that big green bone and that green bone is the sphenoid bone. Now the sphenoid bone for me is one of the uh, most complex um, bones that I've kind of run into, but in it, I, honestly, you know, I've been doing what I've been doing since the last century. And I was, I was always confused by the sphenoid bone because when we talk about the sphenoid bone, we have the different subcomponents. So we have, lesser wings and we have greater wings and we have bodies and we have cellas and we have plates, et cetera. Um, and I never really could figure it out because when I look at this in, in the, on the axial images, you know, I see a lot of green right here and I don't really see very much. Um, but one thing I realized um, is that the sphenoid bone was not based on what we see on cross-sectional imaging. Remember, uh, CAT scans just came out in the 1970s, and the sphenoid bone has been around for hundreds of years. And then what I realized was that the sphenoid bone was not based on cross-sectional imaging, but it was based on these anatomists looking at the sphenoid bone. And when you actually look at the sphenoid bone on FOSS, it sort of looks like a bird. And so once I realized that the sphenoid bone looks like a bird, and some people can say it can look like a butterfly as well too, I guess I'm not as sensitive. I guess I like birds more than butterflies. But when I start looking at the, 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 the birds, all of a sudden I start seeing a wing right here. This wing kind of corresponds to the wing that's seen on the left. And that's a really, really big wing. So that's the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. And the greater wing of the sphenoid bone on axial images on this anatomic structure forms this component right here. And this forms the floor of the middle cranial fossa. So this area right here is where the anterior temporal lobe sits. So if we have a greater wing, then we have to have a lesser wing. And that lesser wing is right here. If you see this little area right here, this is another wing when the, with the leap of faith, it can flap too. And this is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And between the greater wing of the sphenoid bone and the lesser wing is this little fissure right here. And this is the superior orbital fissure in which cranial nerves three, four, and six extend from the cavernous sinus um, anteriorly to uh, extend into the orbit. So the next part about the uh, sphenoid bone is that you have a body and this is the main body of the sphenoid bone. And when you have the body of the sphenoid bone, it sort of corresponds to the body of the bird right here. And then right above that bird, you have this little defect. With a leap of faith, you can little, see a little defect on my illustration. And that little defect is where the floor of the cella is, and that's where the pituitary gland lives. So there's your body of the sphenoid bone, and right above it is where the pituitary gland sits. Now, anytime a bird is flying, it has to land. And in order for it to, to land, it has to have certain feet. And the feet are the pterygoid plates. So we have a medial and a lateral pterygoid plates. And the birds, in this case, don't have two legs, but they have four legs. So you have two medial pterygoid plates and two lateral pterygoid plates, and that's how the bird lands. So one thing to remember as moving forward is if you've ever been confused by the sphenoid bone, if you remember that you look at it on FOSS and it sort of looks like a bird, I think it can help you understand it. And then secondly, the sphenoid bone not only is a wedge-shaped bone, but it's one of the most important bones because it allows various cranial nerves to extend intracranially and extend extracranially. So if you look at the sphenoid bone as well too, you see a hole right here. This is a groove for the optic nerve. We can see another groove uh, right here. This groove runs from posterior to anteriorly. It, uh, you don't get that appreciation as much on this specific uh, depiction, but this is V2. This is the infraorbital um, 
excuse me, this is foramen rotundum. This oval-shaped structure right here is foramen ovale, and right behind it is foramen spinosum for the middle meningeal artery. And if you look real closely behind here, here's the petrous bone, and there's the groove for the carotid artery. So the other thing about the sphenoid bone is that it has a lot of holes in it. In fact, another hole that we talked about right here was a superior orbital fissure. We can sort of see right here, right below the lesser ring of the sphenoid. So a really bad joke that I always use, but it kind of makes the point is that the sphenoid bone is a very religious bone. Why? Because it's very holy. So I'm sorry for that bad joke. But on the other hand, if you can remember that there's a lot of holes in the sphenoid bone, uh, just remember that it allows the egress of various cranial nerves. So you can have cranial nerve number one. The superior orbital fissure is cranial nerves three, four, and five. Um, and cranial nerve uh, foramen rotundum is cranial nerve two. V3, the foramen ovale is for V3, and then you have foramen spinosum. So again, the sphenoid bone has a lot of important functions uh, when it comes to the skull base. So when we look at this on cross, or on uh, in this case, coronal imaging, this demonstrates the sphenoid sinus, which is aerated. Right above this is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. This area right here is the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. As, as we just learned, between the lesser and the greater wing is a superior orbital fissure. And if you extend a little bit more inferiorly, right below the superior orbital fissure is going to be the inferior orbital fissure. And if you take it one step further, if you look at the lateral wall of the nasal bone, there's a little defect between here and here. This is the sphenopalatine foramen, and this extends laterally into the pterygopalatine fossa. So a lot of wonderful anatomy right here, but really the key to understanding this is to understand that concept of the sphenoid bone. So the next thing that we'll do is that we'll talk about some of the common pathology that can involve the anterior skull base. And so when we talk about the pathology, what we're going to discuss is we'll first talk about the benign pathologies, then we'll talk about malignant pathologies, and then we'll finally end um, with a, a component of the talk that is a checklist of things that you should include in your reports. So as I mentioned before, the majority of the lesions that involve the anterior skull base arise from these adjacent structures, the sinuses, the orbits, the lacrimal glands, et cetera. And so for really to understand the importance of, of imaging, I think it's important to really understand what the surgeons do. So one of the privileges that I have is that I have um, joint appointments, as was mentioned before, in both radiation oncology and ENT surgery. And it's probably one of the most richest um, um, uh, associations that I have because I learned so much from my clinical colleagues. So if I'm looking at a brain MRI uh, or an anterior skull base MRI and I see a big mass and I just say there's a tumor there, well, that hasn't done any good because as you'll see, when we look at these tumors, they're clinically obvious. But what's not as obvious is what the surgeons have to do in order to remove these tumors. So the classical approach that's performed for resection of a tumor involved in the anterior skull base is the craniofacial approach. So the first part of the cranio approach, the craniofacial approach is to do this bicoronal skin flap. And basically that flap is cut and then it's peeled down. So this is an image of the bicoronal flap. So what the surgeons have done is made this coronal incision. They've taken the scalp and they've pushed it down. So what we're looking at right here is the frontal bone. This is the calvarium. And then what the surgeons do is that they remove the calvarium. So they're literally looking right down on the frontal sinus. So in this image, they're literally looking right down on the frontal sinus. And this is the frontal lobe. So this gives them visualization and access to the superior portion of the anterior skull base. Then the next thing that they do is they do this lateral rhinotomy, and this is sometimes referred to as the Lynch incision. So they do this lateral rhinotomy, and now what they do is they take the nose, and they literally peel the nose over. So now they have this approach and this gives them access to the inferior portion of the anterior skull base. So now they're from below and they're looking up. So remember the anterior skull base is gonna be right about here. The cranial approach allows them to look down. 
And then the facial approach allows them to look up. And this is what the surgeons have to do in order to remove these lesions. So that's why just to say that there's a tumor there doesn't really make a difference. What we really need to be able to do is to understand the type of surgery that's performed and really provide them information that's gonna make a difference. So what are some benign tumors that involve the anterior skull base? Well, I've just listed a few of these before uh, right here, and we'll go through some of these uh, characteristic lesions. So here's a classical example of a benign lesion involved in the anterior skull base. This is the classical example of a meningioma. We can see this extra axial mass that's arising from the anterior skull base. And with the leap of faith, we can see that there's some irregularity here involving the planum sphenoidale, the roof of the sphenoid sinus. And this is what's referred to as hyperostosis. So meningiomas tend to be hypervascular lesions. In the old days, when we would diagnose meningiomas, and I hate to say this, but I remember those old days, we would end up looking at plain films and looking at this blistering of the bone or the hyperostosis. Now, obviously, we end up getting MRs, but this type of hyperostosis is typically due to hypervascularity from meningiomas giving you this hyperostosis. And when these meningiomas arise from the anterior skull base, they're arising from this anterior uh, groove, the olfactory, the, oh, the uh, olfactory sulcus. And so sometimes these are also called olfactory nerve or olfactory groove meningiomas. Now, here's an example of another meningioma, and this is a non-contrast T1 weighted image. And does anybody see the meningioma right here? So previously we talked about a little bit of blistering of the bone. So one of the things that, why I show this is that sometimes we'll do MRs without contrast for headaches. So we'll do these MRI scans without contrast in patients that have recurrent headaches. And so, you know, oftentimes they're, they're often normal, but just realize when you're looking at these, look for these subtle abnormalities. So here's the floor of the left frontal bone, and you can see how it's very thin, but notice how it's a little bit thickened right here. So sometimes if you do see the sickening, you know, you have to in the back of your mind say, is it possible this could be a small little meningioma? So obviously look at your multiple planes, look at your flare and T2 weighted sequences. But when you do give contrast, we can see that there's diffuse enhancement right here. And then we, the leap of faith, we can see a little bit of speculations here, which correspond to the abnormality that we saw <clears throat> on the non-contrast T1 weighted images. So <clears throat> here's another benign lesion that can involve the anterior skull base. So this is a mass here involving the left maxillary sinus that's extending into the, uh, to the left nasal cavity. And again, I love my anatomy. So here's the fovea ethmoidalis here. This is the lateral lamella. And notice how this lesion is extend extending lateral to the lateral lamella, and it's an actually involving the left ethmoid sinus. And medial to the lateral lamella is the olfactory nerve. So this tumor isn't necessarily involved in the olfactory nerve. It's getting really close to it, but notice how it's just medial to it. So this is a benign pathology that can involve the anterior skull base, specifically the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity. And with the leap of faith, we can almost see these little convolutions or this cauliflower or cerebriform appearance. And this is an example of an inverting papilloma, or I should say inverted papilloma involving the anterior skull base. And here's an example of a classic uh, tumor that can involve the anterior skull base. In this case, it's involving the nasal cavity. It's extending posteriorly. We went over this anatomy before. This is the sphenopalatine foramen. Here's the pterygopalatine fossa. Here's the pterygomaxillary fissure. And we can see that this tumor has takes a right turn. It's going through the left sphenopalatine foramen. It's expanding that foramen, then extending into the left uh, pterygomaxillary fissure. And if I told you that this was an adolescent male and the patient presents with epistaxis, well, we can make the diagnosis of a juvenile angiofibroma. And this is another example of a juvenile angiofibroma. And I specifically show this for two reasons. Number one, this one is specifically involved in the nasal cavity and extending into the anterior skull base. So we can see the erosion here of the roof of the anterior cranial fossa, and we can see that intracranial component. And with the leap of faith, we can actually see abnormal enhancement of the dura. And secondly, when we look at the contrast enhanced study, 
what we see here is this avid enhancement, but we can also see these areas of low, uh, t, of low T1 signal. And these are the multiple flow voids that can be found in juvenile angiofibromas. So remember, juvenile angiofibromas are supplied by the internal maxillary artery. They're highly vascular. And we, what we do is that we look for these multiple flow voids in a patient, uh, in an adolescent male. And this is just a benign lesion involving the anterior skull base. In this case, it's involving the frontal sinus. We can see these large bony lesions here extending into the frontal sinus, and these are multiple osteomas. So when we see multiple osteomas, especially in younger patients, we always have to consider the possibility of some systemic underlying process. And one of the things we always have to consider is Gardner syndrome, because remember Gardner syndrome, patients can present with multiple osteomas and they can present with multiple colonic polyps. And this lesion is a bit of a fooler. So this is a lesion that's involved in the anterior skull base. And when we look at this, we can see there's an obvious mass right here and we can see it's expansile. Now, when we look at this expansile nature, the first thing that we think about, is this a super aggressive mass? Now, the answer is probably not, because look how big this mass is, and we can see that it's actually regressively remodeling and displacing the, the um, lamina propitia. So the lamina propitia is still intact, but it's actually expanded. Now, when we look at the T, excuse me, the CT scan, we can see that it has very, very high attenuation within it. Now you can look at this and the first thing that you'll probably think of is that, is it possible that this could be a tumor? And it's, it's, it's possible for sure. But one thing that anytime that you see a lesion that's involved in the ethmoid sinuses or the frontal sinuses is that remember, you can also have benign lesions arising from this area. And in this case, this was, both of these are examples of expansile mucociles. Now, why are mucociles high attenuation on CT? is because mucociles are chronic processes. And what a mucociles is essentially an isolated sinus that expands and becomes enlarged. And because of the chronicity can sometimes develop desiccated secretions or some type of fungal colonization. So instead of having a nice fluid attenuation within it, it becomes very, very dense. And so that's why it almost can give you this pseudo tumor, if you will, appearance. So this is not certainly not pseudo tumor, but you can see how this can be confused for a tumor because of the concentration of various proteinaceous material. And this is an example of an ant mini. So this was a patient that ends up having a large abnormality involving multiple paranasal sinuses. And so when we look at the paranasal sinuses, we can see there's diffusely high attenuation involving both ethmoid sinuses extending back into the sphenoid sinus. And when we look at the coronal images, we can see this is actually extending into the medial portion of the orbits and extending intracranially. Now, the key to making this diagnosis is to understand that this is a non-contrast CT. This is, has not been given contrast. So what this is, is not an aggressive enhancing tumor, but instead this is the entity known as allergic fungal sinusitis. So what is allergic fungal sinusitis? It is a type of fungal sinusitis, but it's not the type that you probably most commonly think of when we're talking about diabetic or immunocompromised patients. That's invasive fungal sinusitis. So there's actually five types of fungal sinusitis. There is the type of hay fever that you get that can give you nonspecific imaging findings. Then there is a mycetoma, which is the classic fungal, fungal ball. The third type is a granulomatous type of fungal sinusitis, which is typically seen in the Middle East. And I found that very rare. I've just seen a couple of cases. But the next type is this allergic fungal sinusitis, which is seen here. So just remember, it's on the non-contrast study, it involves multiple paranasal sinuses. It has high attenuation. And when the surgeons go in and operate it, it they always talk about this peanut butter or buttery or this pasty substance that's been removed. And then the final type of the fungal sinusitis is the invasive fungal sinusitis, which we'll see in this case. So this is an example of a case of invasive fungal sinusitis. And this was an example of mucormycosis. And unfortunately, this patient succumbed to this disease. So when we look at these imaging findings, what we see 
is an, a somewhat nonspecific pattern, but I want to call your attention to the lack of enhancement of this diabetic patient in which this fungal sinusitis actually extended into the anterior skull base. So notice here, this is all edema. This is all basically turning into liquefaction necrosis of the anterior skull base. This is fundamentally different from the allergic fungal sinusitis. And again, as I mentioned before, this patient succumbed to this disease. And this is typically due to either mucormycosis or, in, or invasive aspergillosis. So what we've done is that we've gone over a variety of benign etiologies that can involve the anterior skull base. And then the next thing that we'll talk about are the malignant tumors that can involve the anterior skull base. So when we look at the type of tumors that can involve the anterior skull base, as I mentioned before, the minority of the lesions are actually arising from the bone. Instead, the majority of the lesions that involve the anterior skull base arise from adjacent structures. So we see pathologies such as esthesioneuroblastomas, adenocarcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, which are arising from the skin. You can have various other sarcomas. Now, some of these can be the osteosarcomas and skull base sarcomas, but remember other sarcomas can also involve from the tissue. Salivary gland tumors, these are typically arising from minor salivary glands or the lacrimal gland. And then as I mentioned before, other various types of lesions. So the most common tumor that's going to involve the anterior skull base is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. And typically the squamous cell carcinomas arise from the sinuses or the nasal cavity. So here's an example of a squamous cell carcinoma involving the ethmoid sinus. And we can see this tumor is extending superiorly into the anterior skull base and extending intracranially. And when we look at the T2 weighted images, we can see that this is associated with vasogenic edema. Now we'll come back to this. We'll talk about the vasogenic edema later because that's gonna be one of those important things that we should include in our reports. Here's a second most common tumor to involve the anterior skull base, and this is going to be an adenocarcinoma. So again, when we look at this, the imaging findings are nonspecific. The only way to make this diagnosis really is to biopsy it. So from a radiological standpoint, you know, we could give a big differential diagnosis, but what's really important in this case to talk about from, an, from, a, from a surgical standpoint, and again, we'll get to our checklist later, but things that you should mention in your report, first of all, is that the location of the tumor, notice how it's eroding the inner cortex of the uh, frontal bone. And look what it's doing to the sphenoid sinus. This is not tumor involved in the sphenoid sinus, Rather, this is a mucosal involved in the sphenoid sinus because this tumor is involved in the ethmoid sinuses and it's obstructing the sphenoethmoidal recess. So this is actually giving you obstruction of the sphenoid sinus. And that's information that the surgeons can't see when they look inter and when they evaluate this patient with endoscopy. Now, this is one of the classic tumors that you'll see involving the anterior skull base. So here we see this mass that's involving the uh, anterior skull base. It looks like it's centered in the superior portion of the nasal cavity. We see this component growing superiorly and look what it's doing to the gyrus rectus. It's displacing the gyrus rectus superiorly. And it's also having this extension extending into the nasal cavity. And then when we look laterally, we can see erosion here of the bilateral lamina papricia. So we can see this intertorbal extension as well too. So when we look at the sagittal images, we can almost, with the leap of fate, say it almost looks like a figure eight. So sometimes in the United States, we'll say this looks like a snowman. Now in Indonesia, you don't get a lot of snow, so you probably are not as familiar with snow, snow people or snowmen, but rather you're probably more familiar with a figure eight. So when you see this, this is a classic appearance of a neuroblastoma, also known as the olfactory groove neuroblastomas. So remember, neuroblastomas arise from the first cranial nerve. We already talked about this. This is growing along the anterior, uh, anterior skull base. It gives these small little neurofibrils. So these neuroblastomas are felt to arise from the small little neurofibrils from the small branches of the first cranial nerve after they pierce the cribriform plate. And that's why you get this waste appearance right here at the anterior skull base. <clears throat> 
Now, this is an example of a bit of an unusual tumor that's involving the anterior skull base. On the left-hand side, this is a non-contrast study, and we can see that it has high attenuation. This is an example of a melanoma. Now, this could be due to other things. This is somewhat of a nonspecific pattern. This could be due to lymphoma and, and other cases. But the reason I show this specifically is notice how this is involving the ethmoid sinus extending into the anterior cranial fossa. And here we can see a little bit of extension right into the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. Now, this is an example of a tumor that's arising from the bone of the anterior skull base. So here we see the soft tissue mass, and with the leap of faith, we can maybe see a few little calcifications here. Now, granted, I have to tell you, when I see these tumors, if I was showing this to my musculoskeletal radiologist, they may suggest that there's small little rings and circles here. I can never see them myself. So in this case, for me, this is a somewhat nonspecific appearance. But if you do see the rings and circles on the bone algorithms, then you can make the diagnosis of a chondrosarcoma involving the anterior skull base. Now, this is an example of a tumor that's involving the anterior skull base. And again, it has this nonspecific appearance. This primarily involves the right ethmoid sinus, and we can see this extension into the medial wall of the right orbit. And really to make this diagnosis, for me, the only way that I can make this diagnosis is if I told you this was a child. So if I told you this was a child and that there was a large aggressive soft tissue tumor involving the head and neck, then the most likely diagnosis is going to be rhabdomyosarcoma. So again, in this case, we have to comment on the extension uh, intraorbitally, and we can also see the associated proptosis. And in this case, we can also see that there's metastases here involving the greater wing of the sphenoid. So if you have a really sharp eye here, you're now an expert. We can see the greater wing of the sphenoid forms the lateral wall of the orbit. And on the right-hand side, we can also see this metastatic deposit extending into the greater wing of the sphenoid. Now, this is a, an example of another uh, childhood tumor. This was a patient that has a tumor involving, again, the anterior skull base with both the uh, intranasal component and an intracranial component. And this is also associated with the cyst. So if you saw this in an adult, then we would probably say it's an esthesioblastoma. But you can tell by this brain MR, this is a child, it's a small child. I think this is a two-year-old child. So then we have to start thinking of very, very aggressive tumors that can involve children. So what are the things that we think of? Well, we have to think of Ewing sarcoma, we have to think of neuroblastoma, we have to think of early aggressive osteosarcomas. And in this particular case, this was a Ewing sarcoma involving the superior nasal cavity. Now, what we've done so far is that we've gone over um, various types of pathology that can involve the anterior skull base. So we went over the most common pathology that you'll see in the anterior skull base. And we talked about the um, benign and malignant lesions. But moving forward, like I mentioned before, a lot of these tumors that I showed you are clinically obvious. These are really, really big lesions. So what we wanna be able to do is understand what the type of surgery is performed by the surgeons and how we can really make a difference in how these patients are treated. Because just saying there's a mass there, we really haven't provided any good information for the surgeons. And remember when they're performing this cranial facial approach, this is a very aggressive per surgical procedure. So how can we really make a difference uh, in these patients? So one way to do this is to have a little bit of familiarity with the staging system. So, you know, I've been the radiologist on the staging system since the eighth, since the fifth edition. So I've been part of it for, since the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth edition. And so I'm not going to hold you accountable for the specific staging. But what I do want to do is talk about specific involvement of specific structures that's going to affect the staging of these tumors. So when we start looking at T1 through T4, the bottom line is, is that T1 are early stage lesions, whereas T4 are more advanced stage lesions. And T4 is divided into T4A and T4B. When you think of T4A, the way to think of this is that T4A is a very advanced lesion 
that the surgeons can still resect and the patient still can have a reasonable outcome. A T4B is again, a very advanced lesion, but the T4B lesions are still technically resectable. But if there are involvement of these various structures, then there's, despite being resected, there's still a very poor outcome, either based on the tumor is very hard to get all of it, or the morbidity associated with that resection is very, very high. And if you look at some of these, con these structures, such as the anterior orbital contents, minimal extension in the anterior cranial fossa, involvement of the dura and the brain, the cranial nerves, these are all things that we can see on imaging that we should consider, we should always include. So one of the things that we can easily determine based on imaging is whether or not the patient has this type of surgery or this type of surgery. Now in this type of surgery, we can see that they've performed a lynch incision, but they've been able to spare the globe. But in this type of procedure, you can see another lynch excision. But in this case, the patient's globe and all of the orbital contacts have been removed. This is called, referred to as an orbital exenteration. So again, these are gory pictures that to look at if you're not used to looking at it, but this is real life information. And so it's incumbent upon us as radiologists to be able to, to understand the type of surgery that's being performed, the effect on the patient, and how we can make a difference in, the, in these patients. So this is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma involved in the nasal cavity. So you can see that this is a big mass. It's avidly enhancing with contrast. And the surgeons can go in and they can biopsy this. But what they really want to know is, is there intraorbital extension? So in this particular case, we can see the lateral aspect of the mass abuts the lamina papricia, and we can see a nice fat plane between the mass and the medial rectus muscle. So in this case, what we can say is that this tumor is limited to the nasal cavity, and there's no intraorbital extension. So the type of surgery that can be performed here is that this tumor can be resected, but the globe can be spared. So Another point that I want to make on this is that if you are doing your anterior skull base studies, notice how the tumoral enhancement is very similar to the, uh, the signal that you'll see in the fat. So sometimes it can be hard to distinguish enhancing tumor from the bright fat on the T1 weighted images. So I always recommend to perform a non-contrast T1 weighted images because we want to be able to leverage the normal fat high T1 signal and use this as a way to separate tumor from extension into the medial wall of the orbit. Now, this is another example of intraorbital extension. But notice in this particular case, there's expansion of the lamina propria, And in this case, the tumor actually abuts the medial wall of the medial rectus muscle. So in this particular case, our job is to say that the tumor has extended into the medial portion of the orbit. It's abutting the lateral wall of the medial rectus muscle. And this really is an intraoperative decision. So once the surgeons get in, they will have to determine whether or not they feel that there is a sufficient fat plane between the medial wall of the orbit and the sinuses. So it really is an intraorbital decision, but our job as the radiologist is to specifically comment on the extent of this intraorbital extension. And this is an example of a large tumor that blew through the inferior floor of the orbit and is completely involved in the inferior rectus muscle. So this is unequivocally advanced intraorbital extension. We always should mention this in our report. And really the majority of the times when you have this amount of involvement of the intraorbital contents because it's involving the inferior rectus muscle and also involving a portion of the medial rectus muscle, this patient will already have limitations of the ocular movement. So in this particular case, that this is just confirmatory that the patients that have limited eye motion is due to tumoral extension into the orbit. So again, this information is important, not only from a primary diagnosis, but to confirm the clinical findings. So the next thing that we should always do for anterior skull-based lesions, and again, to use that concept, is to separate T4A from T4B, is determine whether or not there's minimal extension into the anterior cranial fossa, or whether there's an involvement of the dura or involvement of the brain. 
So how do we do this? Well, <clears throat> the way we do this is by looking at these imaging uh, appearance. So here's an example of a tumor involving the right frontal sinus. Now, if we look at this image, we can see the inner cortex of the frontal bone is coming down. And notice there's tumor involving the frontal bone, but notice there's no abnormal involvement of the dura. So in this particular case, you can comment on this. And this would be one of those cases where you would specifically say there's no involvement of the dura and there's no evidence of vasogenic edema. So in a way, this can be considered as minimal involvement of the anterior cranial fossa. So this would considered be a T4A lesion. Now compare this with this appearance. So here's an example of a tumor involving the anterior skull base. But notice here, notice how there is abnormal enhancement of the dura overlying the frontal bone. So is this either tumor or is it peritumoral inflammation? And the bottom line is we don't know. We're not sure. Our job is to warn the surgeons that, hey, there is actually enhancement of the dura, and it's going to be up to the surgeons to biopsy the dura to see whether or not this is an inflammation, peritumoral inflammation, or whether it's tumor. If it's inflammation, they can go in ahead and resect it. If it's, if it's actually tumor, well, they'll have to do a lot of dural resection, and then this would upstage this to a T4B. But again, extremely important to comment on that dural enhancement. And in this particular case, we can see there's extension of the tumor into the anterior skull base. It's involved in the gyrus rectus. And in the T2-weighted images, we can see all of this vasogenic edema. So when we see this level of edema associated with intracranial extension of squamous cell carcinoma, this is pretty characteristic of brain involvement. This would upstage the lesion to a T4B, and the majority of institutions would not go in and try to resect that tumor. So the next thing that we want to do is to look for cranial nerve involvement. So when we look at uh, T4A and T4B, T4B indicates tumors involving cranial nerves, but not including V2. So V2 is commonly involved and is an area of retrograde perineural spread. So in this particular case, we have a forehead cancer that's involving V1. See this area right here? See this involvement here of V1? That is the first cranial nerve extending along the roof of the orbit. In this particular case, we have a tumor involving the hard palate, the maxillary sinus extending back into the pterygopalatine fossa. And we can see retrograde perineural spread of V2 on the right. So anatomically, this is tumor growing along V2 going through foramen rotundum. This is foramen rotundum back here into the anterior portion of the geniculate ganglion. And in this case right here, if you draw a line to down the middle, you compare one side to the other side. This is the normal appearance of Meckel's cave. This is the small little vascular plexus. And this vascular plexus always points at the trigeminal ganglion. So you can have this classical appearance on the left. So this is what it should normally look like. And on the right-hand side, in this case, we can see that this tumor is extended back into the central skull base. It's involved Meckel's cave and it's involving the trigeminal ganglion, and then there's a little bit of enhancement extending laterally. So these are all examples of perineural spread, and in this case, these are two examples of perineural spread directly into the anterior portion of the genetic ganglion and involvement of the cavernous sinus. And this is an example of carotid artery encasement. So again, at some places in the United States, and I think it's definitely decreasing now than it was before, this is an example of encasement of the carotid artery. The surgeon can still do a jump graph on this if they want to, but at most institutions, I think that it's not performed as commonly as possible. And this is an example of carotid encasement extending into the cavernous sinus. So I want to point out the normal appearance of the cavernous sinus carotid artery on the left. Notice this wider caliber. And on the right-hand side, we can see the caliber is decreased. And the classic um, uh, circumference that we use is 270 degrees. So if we see a tumor that's encased in the carotid artery by more than 270 degrees, we call that carotid encasement. 
Now, if we see a tumor that's abutting the carotid artery and maybe in, uh, casing it by 180 degrees, we still have to mention that. We can't say that it's encased, but we can say that it's focally adherent. So there is a difference in encasement and being focally adherent, and that's based on the circumference that the tumor abuts and surrounds the carotid artery. So that has different implications for the surgeons. And the last thing that we'll talk about are the mimics. So these are things that you can really help your surgeons out if they're not as familiar looking at the imaging studies as you are. So this is an example here of a patient that has an abnormality involving the roof of the orbit involving the anterior skull base. On the non-contrast T1 weighted images, notice how it's intermediate signal on T1. When we give enhancement, notice how the, this lesion is not enhancing and there's only peripheral enhancement. Well, when you see this, it's always important to look at the T2 weighted lesions, but this in fact was a mucosal. And sorry, this is reverse. This should be flipped. Sorry about that. And this is a mucosal involving the left orbit. So just remember, mucoceles can have this confusing picture when we're looking at axial images, and those coronal T2 weighted images can be very helpful in order to make that diagnosis. So this is another case where we can really make a difference. So this is a lesion that's involving the right nasal cavity. So when we look at this, a couple things kind of stand out. So first of all, is this acute or is it chronic? Well, it's probably chronic. Why? Because notice how the right nasal cavity is widened on the right compared to the left. And when we look at the medial wall of the right maxillary sinus and compared to the opposite side, notice that medial wall is displaced as well. So there's expansion of the right nasal cavity. When we look at the T1-weighted images, we can see that there is fluid within this or not necessarily fluid, but it's not a solid lesion. It's kind of, it's kind of cystic. So one thing that I've learned over time is as I'm going through lots of cases, you know, I could be inclined to say this is polypoid mucosal thickening involving the alveolar recesses, and there's polypoid mucosal thickening involving the nasal cavity next case. But one thing that you should always do is that you should always look at the anterior skull base and specifically look at the anatomy that we talked about before. Look at the fovea ethmoidalis, look at the lateral lamella, because in this case, what this was, was an encephalocele that extended inferiorly through the anterior skull base into the nasal cavity. So what you don't wanna do is that you don't wanna call this a, a, a polyp uh, because if the surgeons operate on this, unfortunately, they're gonna be operating on dysplastic blain that has herniated through the anterior skull base. Here's another abnormality involved in the anterior skull base. Here's the fovea ethmoidalis. We can see this large lesion right here. You can sometimes get confused with this and say, hey, is this an extending into the orbit? But when you look at the bone algorithms, then you can just make the diagnosis here of the classical appearance of fibrous dysplasia with its ground glass appearance. And this will um, end out, and I think this is my last case or maybe one case afterwards, but it really emphasizes the complementary nature of MR and CT. So you see something like this on, on MR, and we see this quite frequently. You have this weird lesion that's involved in the, uh, in this case, the central skull base. We look at this and, and it has a little bit of an enhancement, and then we look at the T2-weighted images, and it's very, very bright. Now you may say this and say, hey, is this a chordoma? Because chordomas can give you high T2 signal, but this is way too bright for the high T2 signal that's typically seen in chordoma. This looks like fluid. Chordomas can have high T2 signal, but it's typically due to fissiliferous cells. They're sort of mucoid cells, but rather this is very, very bright. So if you see something like this, you have a couple of options. What you can do is say, I'm not really sure about this. You can say to the surgeons, I don't know what it is, and you have to biopsy it, which is a possible, or what you can do also do is get a follow-up MR in these case to determine whether or not they're stable. So you have some options. But the other option that you can do is also to get a CT scan on these patients. So this is that same lesion in the uh, a sagittal plane and the coronal plane. Again, you can see this this sort of uh, uh, this high T1 signal. And with the leap of faith, you can see it's sort of surrounded by low T2 signal. And when you do a CT scan, this is just an example of fibrous dysplasia. 
So the point being is that when you have these weird lesions that can involve the anterior skull base, the sphenoid sinus of the central skull base, and you see it on MR, they can be really confusing. But remember, one way to help you problem solve is to get a CT scan. And then oftentimes what you'll see is the classical appearance of a fibrosseous lesion, which in this case is fibrous dysplasia. So in summary, what I've done over the last 50 minutes or so, and I think we lay, maybe left a couple of time uh, for questions or um, whatever we want to do with it, is that we talked about the anterior skull base. So what we did is that we talked about the definition of the anterior skull base. We talked about the imaging anatomy. And remember, for radiologists, anatomy is key. Anatomy is key. Pathology, you can learn the pathology over time, but especially for the residents, you know, anatomy is so important. So focus on that anatomy. And then we talked about specific information that we should include in our reports. So when you're looking at the anterior skull base, we should specifically mention intraorbital extension. Is there intracranial involvement? Is there carotid encasement? Or is there extension into the cavernous sinus? All of these, and hopefully when we have our multidisciplinary discussion, the surgeons will attest to the importance of these imaging findings in our reports and how they affect surgery. And then finally, we talked about the mimics and how there are certain lesions that are don't touch lesions and how we can use both CT and MR to help problem solve. So I'll stop right there. Uh, again, it's been a pleasure uh, to give this presentation. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be participate in the seminar. I see 322 participants. It's an amazing turnout. And again, thank you for the honor and the privilege for participating. Thank you, Professor S. Very uh, excellent lecture. And yeah, there is one question. Oh, good morning, Professor Suras. I'm Adi, uh, an intern in the radiology department of Saiful Anwar Hospital. Yeah, would like to ask a question. How can we really differentiate it between neoplasm that arise from the dura that extend to the adjacent organs and the neoplasm that arise from the brain adjacent to the dura that erode the dura and spread to organs adjacent to the dura? So the tumor is coming from inside or ex ex internal or external, uh, intraaxially or extraaxially. How can we if, if, uh, involve both of them? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So in general, the tumors that are going to arise intracranial are going to be primary brain tumors. And in general, the primary brain tumors have secondary involvement of the dura. So th those tend to be relatively straightforward. I think what this person is asking is really how do we localize and center it? And so in general, in general, if something's arising from the dura or below the dura, the bulk of the tumor is gonna be below the dura and below the anterior skull base. So part of it is just based on localization where you think the big bulk of the tumor is and where the central portion is. Now, occasionally, and I don't have it in this, this talk, but I have a, in it in a different talk, where I find it really confusing is that on occasion, and I've seen this about five times, I've actually seen meningiomas present as masses involving the masticator space. And that is because sometimes meningiomas can actually arise within the greater ring of the sphenoid and the dura and extend both inferiorly and superiorly. But in general, what I try to do is that if I don't see something that's a classic brain tumor involved in the dura, what I, and I see it's involving the maxillofacial region, I try to find where the bulk of the tumor is, figure out where the center of it is. And once I figured out where the center of it is, that actually helps me localize the tumor uh, more accurately. Okay, thank you, for Professor Suresh. Uh, I think we still have time, but uh, after uh, the discussion, after the presentation, uh, Professor Suresh, thank you again for your uh, very excellent uh, lecture. As always, you're always waiting for your lecture, and uh, we. Uh, back to Dr. Vidyana, to second presentation by Dr. Sri. And then after the third presentation will be discussion, Professor. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vidyana, time is yours.
Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Andre. Uh, and then now uh, for second session, second speaker uh, is Dr. Sri Andriani Utomo, and the moderator is me. And before this, I will read some curriculum vitae of Dr. Sri Andriani Utomo. Uh, she's a staff and senior lecturer in radiology department, Sutomo General Hospital, and also a foreign relationship for Indonesia Radiological Society, the secretary of the Indonesian Neuroradiology Society, a member of AOSN HNR, and she also uh, have many team in uh, Sutomo General Hospital, uh, such as sp spinal team, musculoskeletal society, and sport team also. And uh, she also has many research that has been published. Uh, so for Dr. Sirandriani, uh, we'll presenting brain tumor imaging in neuroradiology. Uh, Dr. Sri, please and time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Vidyana. So I will share my screen. Good evening, everyone, and special for Professor Suresh Kumar Mukherjee. Good morning, Prof. How are you? We are very happy to meet you in this virtual meeting. And for everyone, for this session, I will share with all of you about brain tumor imaging. Brain tumor imaging. I will overview about conventional MRI and then advanced MR imaging, cases of brain tumor and mimic, and at last take home for it. Okay, so we see about the conventional MRI. For T1, it's just hyperintense when we want to see like containing fat tissue subacute hemorrhoids and proteinaceous fluid, ebullitious hyperintense and T1 with it imaging. T2, T2, this is a water imaging. So usually many lesions ebullitious hyperintense signal in T2. So when T2 it's just hypointense, we should think maybe most of paramagnetic stages of blood except hyperacute blood and extracellular, like hemoglobin. Calcification shows hypointense in T2. Fibrous lesion, highly cellular tumors with a high nucleus or c 2 plus ratio, producing low lesional water content, for instance, lymphoma and medulloblastoma. Vascular flow void. Mucin, desiccated mucin, as seen in desiccated sinus secretory, and it's just hypointense on T2 with the images. And now we see about the contrast enhancements in conventional MR. Blood brain barrier, as we know, the brain has a unique triple layer blood brain barrier with tight endothelial junction in order to maintain a consistent internal milieu. Contrast will not leak into the brain unless this barrier is damaged. An enhancement is seen when a central nervous system tumor destroys the blood-brain barrier. Extra-axial tumors such as meningium and stratoma are derived from brain cells and do not have a blood brain barrier, so they will enhance. So for this enhancement, it doesn't mean if this tumor is malignant. There is also no blood brain barrier in the pituitary gland, pineal body, and choroid plexus regions. Some non-tumor lesions enhance because they can also break down the blood brain barrier and may simulate a brain tumor include infections, demilinating disease, 
like multiple sclerosis and infarction. Now we see some cases with conventional MRI. We see male 53 years with right hemiplegia. So what we see in CT scan, we see there is slight hypotense area. Okay. In this left corona radiata. So what do you think? We don't see any perifocal edema, or maybe just on this slide, perifocal edema. So we will think many about this lesion. It could be tumor. It could be infection. It also could be infarction. We continue to perform MR. MR, a diffusion weighted imaging. It shows restricted diffusion area. We agree because I've seen in ADC, it shows hypoidense. So this is a restricted diffusion area. In flare imaging, it shows slight hyperintense, slight hyperintense, and also in T2, it shows slight hyperintense. We don't see any perifocal edema in this lesion. And now what we see again, post contrast studies just show slight contrast enhancement. Slight contrast enhancement, and we see there is a, like a sweet contrast enhancement. It doesn't look like tumor with contrast enhancement. Or maybe if this is tumor, maybe this is a low grade glioma. Or maybe this is infarction. So what do you think? But infection, it doesn't look like infection. Okay, so now we see how about the MR angiography. The MR angiography for this lesion, this is the key for the diagnosis. So what we see here, we see this is a normal right internal carotid artery. And where is the left internal carotid artery? We see there is men, so stenosis of the left internal carotid artery, and we do see the flow here, and also the flow in the left middle cerebral artery we cannot see. So the last stenosis for this lesion, it should be a little good thrombotic infarction with mild luxury perfusion. And this is not tumor, and also this is not infection, but this is a stroke infarction. So the last diagnosis is solid acute thrombotic infarction with mild luxury perfusion. So this is not tumor, this is not infection, but this is stroke infarction. Okay, now we see another case. This is male, 50 years with right kidney paralysis. What you see in CT scan, we see there is slight hypodense lesion with hyperdense ring and slight perifocal edema in this left thalamus region. When you see this CT scan, this is a non contrast CT scan, we will think maybe. This is a solid mass that shows a high cellularity with hypertense signal and then with central necrotic area could be. But with this lesion, it should be have a large perifocal edema. But in this lesion, there is no or slight perifocal edema. If this is infection, could be, maybe this is a cerebral toxoplasmosis, could be like this one. Or anything else. So we see in MR imaging. What you see in this MR, this is a diffusion weighted imaging with ADC. We see this shows a restricted diffusion area, and we see there is a hypo-intense signal rip. So we should think maybe this hyper-intense signal would be 
blood then because blood could be also shows a restrictive intuition with it imaging. Okay, we see again okay, in this protein echo, we can see this rain. This is a hemocytoid rain. And what we see in T1 and T2. T1 is shows hyperintense signal for this reaction, and in T2 it shows also hyperintense signal. So we think this is a late subacute so intracerebral hemorrhage that in CT scan, this hemorrhage already resolves. So the density for the resorption of blood and it shows hypodense because the horse unit already lower. So in CT scan, CT scan is very good to delineate an acute intracerebral hemorrhage because everyone will see hemorrhage with hypertense signal. But in subacute hemorrhage, in CT scan, the blood already resolves. So we will see like the previous we see before. So it doesn't look like blood or let subacute hemorrhage that's already resolved. So CT scan is not very good to see a subacute hemorrhage that already resolves. But MR, we still see with a hyper intense signal in T1 and hyper intense signal in T2. So it shows there is an extracellular methemoglobin that consistent with lead subacute hemorrhage. So the last diagnosis is lead subacute hemorrhage with extracellular methemoglobin. Now we see about advanced MR imaging and when we will use this advanced MR imaging. We see what the perfusion imaging. There are two kinds of MR perfusion. We can use contrast or we don't need contrast. When we want to use contrast, we should choose whether we want to perform a TSC MR perfusion or DCE MR perfusion. TSC or dynamic susceptibility or trust MR perfusion, this is a main metric in cerebral blood volume. Perfusion curves in glioma should return close to baseline and perfusion curves in tumors with leaky capillaries like metastasis, choroid plexus tumors, extra axial tumors generally do not return to baseline. High, higher blood volume suggests higher grade of progressive or recurrent tumor. Now we see about PCE, it also use contrast. This is a dynamic contrast enhanced and prompt perfusion. The main metric is the volume transfer constant, a measure of permeability. So high permeability suggests higher grade and within a tumor may identify regions of higher grade as well or progressive or recurrent tumor. Arterial spin labeling. This is a non-contrast MR perfusion. The main metric is cerebral blood flow. This is non-contrast technique of MR perfusion. We use the internal contrast with the arterial blood. So we see higher blood flow can be used for tumor breeding or to identify progressive tumor. Now, how about the MR spectroscopy? For assessing tumor biochemical or metabolic profile, tumor spectra include elevated choline, decreased NAA, higher grade glioma ratio, higher choline NAA ratio, and choline creatine ratio, then lower grade glioma. Lipid and lactate peaks are not normal and represent necrosis and hypoxia, respectively. And diffusion tensor imaging, this analysis direction or diffusivity 
and orientation of white metal tracks. Tractography demonstrates displacement of the white metal track, infiltration or destruction of my white metal fiber tracks. This is important for surgical planning. So we see cases. We see some case. Now this is metastasis or infection. So we see this female, 50 years with habits. So what you see in this post-contrast study, we see there are multiple nodules relation. This nodules, nodules, and there's also rain contrast enhancing nodules. This is a nodule, nodular patient. In the cortical and also in the subcortical region, in periventricular region also, and this also we will see. This is in the sistera region. This in the leptomeningeal region. There is no perifocal edema. And what we see in MR perfusion, MR perfusion we see in this lesion, we can see it shows a highly cerebral blood volume and it never go back to the baseline. This baseline is here, but just only in this part and they never go back to the baseline. And then in this lesion, we see in the normal area, we see this is normal cerebral blood volume, and then it go back to the baseline. Now, what we see also in this lesion, it also shows the same. It shows a very high cerebral blood volume, and after this, it never return to the baseline. But the normal brain tissue, it shows cerebral blood volume and it go back or return to the baseline. MR spectroscopy, it shows a high choline creatine ratio and also choline and AA ratio with high lipid and lactate metabolism. And the final diagnosis of this patient, this patient have a metastatic process and we look for the primary tumor is from the breast cancer. So not always when we see in this metastatic process, usually it's just tumor with a large perifocal edema or tentacles like perifocal edema, but not always. When we see a multiple nodules, sometimes you don't see the perifocal edema. Metastatic process also can make a leptomeningeal metastasis, but for this patient, just only nodular and red contrast enhancing nodules metastatic process. Okay, we see another case female, 45 years with headaches. We see in post contrast study, we also see many nodular and also red contrast enhancing nodules in all the cortical and subcortical and also in the arachnoid space, we can see also there is a leptomeningeal contrast enhancement. So this is a leptomeningeal metastasis with a multiple nodular metastatic process in the intraaxial, or this is infection. So we see there is also basal system contrast enhancement. So what we see, maybe this is tuberculomatosis in meningal and cephalitis TB, or could be this is metastatic process. So we see in MR spectroscopy, we also see there is increase of choline creatine and choline and AE ratio. We cannot say this is malignancy with MR spectroscopy itself. We should see other advanced MR like MR perfusion. Okay, in this MR perfusion, in the selection side and in the normal brain tissue side, there is no increase of cerebral blood 
for you for this lesson. So with this MR perfusion and we see the MR spectroscopy, we agree this is not malignancy. Though MMR spectroscopy it shows increase of choline creatine and choline NAA ratio. Because choline creatine and choline NAA ratio, choline it shows a membrane cell turnover. So we know an infection also will increase of membrane cell turnover. So we can see in MR spectroscopy in infection. It also shows increasing of choline creatine and choline NAA ratio. But in MR perfusion, we can see there's no increase of cerebral blood volume at all. So when we see this one, we agree if this is infection. And the final diagnosis, this is a meningo, meningo and superlitis TB with tuberculosis. Okay, so now we see another case, 50 years woman with sudden right hemiparesis. T1 and T2, we see there is a ISO intense signal in the frontal region. And at T2, it shows hybridal signal. And what we see in this creatine echo, it shows this is a blood contact. But after we see in contrast, enhance MR imaging. What we see? This is a large mass with this is solid part of the mass that shows heterogeneous contrast enhancement with rain contrast enhancement. So we see this is tumor with intratumoral hemorrhoids. This is not a pure intracerebral hemorrhoids. And what we see in this MR perfusion, we can see in the solid part of the lesion, we see there is a very increase of cerebral blood volume and it never returned to the baseline. So what we see this one, this intensity curve, it shows this is a malignancy and this is not from the primary brain tumor like glioma or glio. Plus toma for this lesion. But we think mostly this is a malignancy, but consistent with a metastatic process. And we see in this MR spectroscopy, it also shows increase of choline creatine and choline NAA ratio. The last diagnosis this is metastatic process. So, suggesting of intratumoral hemorrhoids when there is an irregular shape, atypical mutation, heterogeneous appearance with solid part enhancing mass. Peritumoral edema is also an important feature in the differential diagnosis because it is only rarely seen in the acute phase of spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhoids. While it is a very common feature in expanding space occupying lesion success tumors. So for this lesion, the diagnosis is metastatic tumor from breast cancer with intratumoral hemorrhoids that looks like intracerebral hemorrhoids. Okay, now we go to the last case, female, 12 years with headaches. So what you see this one, this is diffusion within imaging. There is no restricted diffusion. And how about in T2 flare and T2 imaging? We see there's a hyper intense signal in the corpus callosum. But what we see in post contrast study, it's just like a heterogeneous contrast enhancement, but not looks like a tumor contrast enhancement. So we see there's a period type of enhancement. So what does it cause? This is tumor, but tumor, what kind of tumor? In the corpus callosum, and we see in post contrast, it doesn't look like tumor, but this is a chiral type contrast enhancement. 
Okay, so we see it is gradient echo. Gradient echo, we don't see any plot, but maybe this is like a collateral feed, maybe, because gradient echo is not good to see the collateral feed actually. We should use a susceptibility with the PPT. But in this patient, we perform a gradient echo. We don't have this susceptibility with the imaging with this MR machine. So we see here. Now we can see this is in a corpus callosum in T2. In T2, we can see here. And post contrast study is like this one. It doesn't look like tumor with contrast enhancement. There is no perifocal edema. There is no budget press. And we perform also this MR phenography. We can see there is stenosis in the rectus sinus. In our angiography, it doesn't show any upper quality. So what the final diagnosis is for this lesion, this is a thrombosis at rectus sinus. So what we see in MR, in conventional MR, we should think if this is a deep famous thrombosis or deep sinus thrombosis. Okay, now we go to the take home point. Conventional or structural MRI is very important to make interpretation and decision what we should do next. What kind of advanced MRI we should perform? 3D ASL, DCE MR perfusion. The SC MR perfusion, MR spectroscopy, or DDI with tractography. Okay, thank you. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sriandrani. This is so excellent lecture from you, from you, and many cases is interesting. And uh, we have some question there is uh, some question for you and for professor sures uh yeah maybe for dr sri yeah this is from dr Han muhtar hanafi from dr muhtar hanafi from solo sometimes we got confused to differentiate tumor from infection with no more clinical data gain for both uh, some question, some sequence in MRI had been identified, but still can differentiate them. Can we use finally ADC map for adjusting to more from infection? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mukhtar Hadafi. And okay, your a question. Cut of point, Dr. Sri. Uh, maybe Dr. Okay, so the first, we usually perform conventional MRI. Can you hear my voice? Good, good, yeah. good, good, good. Okay, so the first, we should perform a MR for the conventional MR. From conventional MR, we make a suggestion whether we can make a diagnosis from this conventional MR or not. If it cannot make a diagnosis, we perform differential diagnosis, and then we choose whether we need to perform advanced MR imaging for this lesion or not. Because uh, we cannot perform advanced MR imaging before we see the conventional MR. The conventional MR is important. And then we make differential diagnosis if we cannot make a definite diagnosis, and then we should perform advanced MR imaging, like MR perfusion, MR spectroscopy, and then if you want to see about the ADC value, you can also perform a diffusion with it imaging and ADC to see the ADC value. But the ADC value, sometimes we cannot sure for the ADC value itself. So for the advanced MR imaging, we should perform not just only one advanced MR imaging, but we can perform uh, several advanced MR imaging like MR spectroscopy and then mix with advanced uh, MR perfusion. Or maybe sometimes if we cannot use contrast study, we can perform maybe like a 3D ASL. 
Ya, ya, Dokter Hanafi. Ya, thank you, Dokter Sri. And uh, maybe I continue with a question from Dokter Hanafi also for Professor Sures. Uh, Professor Sures, regarding double primary tumor, Prof, malignant and benign, can it happen in brain, Prof? And how about yeah. the pathological? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations to Dr. Andrea. It was a fantastic lecture and I learned a lot. So it's a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, and just briefly, I wanted to really emphasize what she said. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been, I grew up in the last century and I trained in the last century. So I've been doing MRs for, I don't want to say 100 years, but for, for a long time. And what happens is that when we get all the advanced imaging techniques, we tend to think that the advanced imaging technique is the gold standard. The gold standard really is to always be familiar with the characteristic imaging findings on conventional imaging. And then the advanced imaging technique should be used as a problem solving. And even yesterday at, at the tumor boards that I had, um, that I was listening in on for the brain tumor boards, somehow something that was a classic brain tumor, the, you know, one of the younger radiologists started saying, well, you know, we can see this DWI appearance or this perfusion appearance in an abscess. And then all of a sudden a classic tumor was now, they were thinking it could be an infection. And I think, you know, the clinicians obviously knew that it was tumor, but my point is, is that, my point is, is that um, um, these are really problem solving techniques. And secondly, if you are gonna be using perfusion there are different types of perfusion, as, as was mentioned, um, DCE, dynam dynamic contrast, T2 susceptibility, and there are different ways to acquire it. If you are going to be doing it, you know, set up a protocol such that you can actually follow up to see what you're, whether you are right or wrong. Um, because again, we had a case yesterday that was initially thought that it was negative, but then three months later, the patient has a big recurrence. So the only way we're going to add value in the long term really is to, if you are going to be doing these things, set up prospectively, see how good you are and whether or not at some point you should modify your technique. So uh, bottom line is I thought it was a great talk. And those are just some of the things I'll share with you from my experience regarding this specific answer. The answer is yes. On very rare occasions, I have seen benign tumors are associated with malignant tumors. And we used to call those coalition tumors. So I think I've seen maybe five or 10 of these where I've seen meningiomas overlie a metastases. And it's been very unclear to me whether or not that was just due to coincidence, the patient just had bad luck, or some people claim that if the patient has a meningioma and it's hypervascular, and then the patient develops an overlying metastases, then it's possible that could be due to the hypervascularity and therefore of the meningioma. So therefore the patient has a propensity to help deposit hematogenous metastases to that site. So they're rare, but I have seen it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Sures. Uh, maybe we now continue with the third speaker. Okay, the third speaker, uh, Dr. Angraini, and uh, the moderator is Dr. Sri. The moderator is Dr. Sri Andrea Newtomo. Uh, Dr. Ang Dr. Dr. Angraini uh, yeah. will give a uh, will presenting tumor in head and neck. Please, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Vidiana. Okay, Dr. Angraini. So I will speak some CV from you, Dr. Angraini. Dr. Angraini uh, is working in Department of Radiology, Universitas Erlanga, and in Universitas Erlanga Hospital. She is also the Vice President of Indonesian Neuroradiology Society, and also members of AOS and HNR, and also the member of AC and ECR. Okay, Dr. Angreni, will show some cases about head and neck. Maybe two cases yet, Dr. Angreni. Okay, please, the audience are yours, Dr. Angreni. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Moderator. And I also invite the panelists to involve this discussion. Uh, I, I have uh, two cases, but if uh, there is time, 
I will continue to the third. So I will present my first case. Can you see my uh, slide, Dr. Sri? Yes, yes, I can. Please pick a slide. Show. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, skull based pathology cases for discussion. Uh, as introduction, the number of tumors and tumor like lesions with different types in histology occurs in the skull base. The main role of imaging is the detection and characterization of skull based lesions with evaluation of the extent of invasion or preservation of adjacent critical organs. CT and MRI imaging are the preferred modalities. Knowledge of clinical issues and awareness of variant of skull based tumors are helped in making diagnosis. The purpose of CT and MR uh, to evaluate lesion characterization, paranasal involvement, Involvement of extracranial soft tissue, bone involvement, neurovascular involvement, invasion to brain, and variation of skull base anatomy. So uh, this is uh, the first case. The identity of the patient, uh, a female patient, 23 years old, uh, live in Surabaya, married, and entered to the hospital at June 7, 2022. And the chief complaint is drop left eye. Drop left eye gradually from uh, one year before admission, after the patient gave, uh, gave birth and got worsened three months before. Patient also had decrease of sight with no double vision. Patient got a mild headache on left side and felt different on the body, lower and upper limb also on the left side. There was no cough, common cold, nor other signs of infection. There was no seizures or weakness on the side of uh, the body. There was no history of trauma. So uh, this is the time. Uh, on June 2021, felt different on the left side of the body, especially the upper and lower limb, but mild and decrease of sight in the left eye and felt different on the left eyelid. On March 2022, dropped left eyelid, worsened left eyesight and tingling on the left side of the body. Uh, from the history, no hypertension, no diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, or cardiac disease were denied. Patient is neither a smoker nor a drinker. There was no history of uh, medication. Uh, from the physical examination, the vital sign is in the, with the normal limits, also head and neck uh, test, chest, abdomen, or extremity. Uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale 4, 5, 6, and the meningial signs uh, within normal limits. The cranial nerves, first nerves within normal limit, uh, optic nerve and uh, pulmotor, palpial anisocor, in the uh, right, three millimeter, in the left, five millimeter, red reflexes uh, in the left, Side is minus uh, the VOD two uh, part sixty and uh, VOS one uh, part three hundred. Visual field difficult to evaluate and there is ptosis in the left. From the third, fourth, and sixth uh, cranial nerve, there is ophthalmoplegia at uh, third nerve and sixth nerve at the left side and uh, the trigemina uh, sensory within normal limit and corneal effects are uh, still positive. Uh, other cranial nerves were within normal limits. Motoric, uh, hip tendon reflex, and uh, uh, sensory, cerebellar, and 
other is normal. Laboratory also within normal limits. Oh, this is a platelet, uh, 413,000. So the clinical diagnosis is ptosis at the left side, midriasis, chronic disease of uh, left vision, left uh, eye, and chronic headaches. Topical diagnosis at uh, sinus cavernosus and etiology uh, diagnosis may be more. Uh, so from this uh, clinical uh, findings and laboratory findings, maybe uh, there is a comment before I continue to the uh, imaging findings from panelists or, or from Professor Suresh, is there any question before I continue to imaging finding? Um, no question. Uh, no, no, nothing no. for me. If, if I, I just, I think you, you are saying the patient does have an abnormality involved in the left cavernous sinus. Is that what I said? What I hear you say? It's a ptosis, and you're suspicious for something involving the cavernous sinus. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, one practical thing that I will say is that for the for the for the uh, surgeons or the radiation oncologists on this is that if you are clinically suspicious of a lesion extending into the cavernous sinus. Um, work with your radiologist to just not to order a standard brain MRI, but work with them to order a dedicated MR of uh, the skull base um, and make sure that the acquisitions are thin enough to evaluate the detailed structures in the cavernous sinus. So, you know, one day you, there, there's a lot of beautiful anatomy that can help separate the cavernous sinus from Meckel's cave, from the trigeminal ganglion, mm -hmm. from cranial nerves three through six. We can see all of those. But the only way that's really going to become vivid and come to life um, is to have those protocols and make sure that you order those when the patients have the appropriate clinical symptoms. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Yet, you will show the picture. Yeah, yeah. Let me show the picture. Yeah, this is the uh, Excel B1. And the right side is the T2 Excel. So we see a uh, hypo intense on T1 and uh, in homogeneous intensity on T2, I think uh, there is a cystic lesion. And let me, uh, so, sorry. This is after contrast injection. And this is from sagittal view. This is T2 flare, and this is gradient echo. So we see some uh, loss of intense there. Uh, I got the one uh, sagittal view. The mass is uh, continue to the very great fossa, I think this one. And this is the skull base. And we do also the MR angiography. Uh, I think within normal limits and the mass is pushed the uh, M1 segment to upper part. And uh, here is the uh, mass uh, that push also the left internal carotid artery. So, uh, should we discuss now? 
from these pictures. Any comment from panelists, maybe? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Angre, for your nice uh, case. Uh, can uh, from uh, the clinics and the uh, picture, can we uh, diagnose the your patient uh, swanoma, or you have uh, uh, the other uh, diagnose maybe? Yeah, uh, I think we uh, first we localize the the uh, tumor. I think this is uh, in the central skull base. I think uh, in the uh, cavernous sinus, left side cavernous sinus. And second, the characterization of the tumor, this is non-homogeneous, histic, and also a content of uh, a blood content, I think. And some I see the uh, fruit fruit level. So in my opinion, this is a, a tumor that uh, coming from in the central skull base. And then uh, it, it might be affect the, uh, the foramina in the, in the skull base. What do you think? Uh, maybe Dr. Sri, do you have uh, some idea with the skull base? So when I see this one, I see the first, this is an extra axial base, not yep. the extra axial part. And then it involves the cavernous sinus. And this tumor is quite large with a solid part in the ring, in the peripheral, and with a necrotic mm -hmm. area in the central part. Because when we see in post contrast study, it shows a rim contrast enhanced, but with a thick solid part in the peripheral area. Uh, but I'm not sure whether what kind of tumor it could be. This is young patient. Yeah. 23 years old. 23 yeah. years old. Female. Female patient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dr. Ramdoni, maybe uh, I like any uh, with a necrotic idea area, with the cystic part, or could be also. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Angre. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good morning, Prof. Suresh. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Dr. Angre, I think uh, it is a little bit confusing with the malignancy in my field in ENT or others, but I think um, from the chief complaint, there is a ptosis in the left eye and after we examine the CT and also the MRI. Um, from the pterygoid fossa, I think it is not a specific case from the uh, tumor of the ENT or, or head and neck. Um, if we talk about the tumor or malignancies, I think it is soft, soft tissue tumor or, so, or soft tissue malignancy that can uh, arise from the meningeal maybe, or yeah, I think there is no specific uh, tissue from, from our side. If we see the, the sinus, maybe we can see the pterygoid sinus, but I think the involvement of pterygoid sinus is not too clear, but I think um, maybe it's more to my colleagues, Dr. Rihasto maybe can explain more about this case. Thank you. Please, Dr. Viasto, may be correlated with the uh, clinical findings uh, of tamoplegia. Dr. Viasto? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rangre. Uh, good morning, Prof. Suresh in US and all the colleagues in Indonesia. <clears throat> so uh, I looked at the MRI. It is clear that it, it, it seems like it is a soft tissue uh, tumor, but I'm not sure if it is arise from a bone tumor or a soft tissue tumor, or it is uh, some kind of chondrosarcoma that usually uh, arise in a very uh, in a young young adult or in in, in a childhood. But I'm, I'm not sure uh, about the the specific 
pathology of the tumor itself. Um, may I see the picture again? Okay. Which one, Dr. Viesto? Uh, the axial one, please. Axial one. Uh, axial uh, T2 or T1 or flare. Okay. Uh -huh. This is flare. Uh, yeah, the left. Yeah, the left side. Huh? This is the My... uh, the right side is the uh, radiant echo. Mm -hmm. And the flare. Okay, it looks like uh, some kind of epidermoid tumor, if I'm not mistaken. It looks like, but I'm not sure with the pathology. Dr. Angreni, do you also have like a diffusion with the imaging for this lesion? Uh, I will, oh, I don't saw this thing, but that's uh, not, uh, uh, this is unrestricted, not restricted. Maybe I will play again this part. Why oh, can hmm. yeah? Are the opinion maybe prof from Dr. Professor Suresh? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll go on a limb on this. So you know, one thing that the only way I learn over time is to be completely wrong and embarrass myself. So. Um, I'm going to, like I said, it's the first time I've seen this. So full disclosure, I've never seen these images before. And uh, you were going through it pretty fast. But, you know, the only way oh, I learned is so wrong. Good. Yeah. What's So uh, what's that? Yeah. Uh, it, I play a game. Yeah, yeah. Just so yeah, this is, yeah, this is what I think it is. So I think what we have is a, it's an extra axial heterogeneous mass that's arising mm -hmm. from the central skull base. Yep. And it looks like it's slow growing. So if the, actually, the images that I want to see are the coronal T ones, uh, the coronal T ones post contrast and the sagittal T twos, um, because it looks like it's slow growing and there's not a lot of vasogenic edema. So that tells me that there's not any brain in invasion. And I think when you were showing the coronal T ones post contrast, yeah, on the on the right hand screen, um, if you could run that, that would be great. I thought I saw some erosion of the floor of the middle cranial fossa. Um, and so what I think this is gonna be, if, if I had to pick one diagnosis, I think all the diagnoses that were said are, are, are spot on, they're all included. But if I was, I'd like to give one diagnosis and be proven wrong. Um, I think that this is gonna be a schwannoma um, that's involving the um, fifth cranial nerve, maybe the trigeminal ganglion, or uh, so I think it's gonna be a fifth nerve schwannoma. So I'll go out on a limb. And if actually you look right there, if you look, and I can't, I don't have the ability to look at the screen, but if you take your red arrow, that little red pointer, and you, and you go down a little bit more inferiorly, two centimeters and look at the skull base, see how that area around frame and ovale is a little bit whitened. And if you look at frame and ovale on the right side, I think I see like this little line coming down, which is the normal V3 on the right. So if I had to be pushed, um, I would think that this would be a schwannoma involving the uh, trigeminal ganglion. So I may be wrong, but I like, to, I like to go out on the limb. And then if you look at the sagittal T2s, it sort of has that schwannoma-like appearance where it's not homogeneous, but has a lot of solid and cystic components. So I'll stop there and then um, you can embarrass me in front of my international audience. Don't, <laughs> don't take my visiting professorship away. Okay? <laughs> Of course not. Yeah, uh, because the clinician think that there is thing clean, so they they do by themselves uh, the uh, the DSA. If this is the, this is the right uh, internal carotid artery, and then yeah, this one from the lateral and this is a right uh, external carotid artery uh, 
from a deposition and this is uh, from lateral side. Yeah, continue to uh, left internal carotid artery. We will see that. Uh, yeah, yeah. We we see something here, Professor. I think uh, in the uh, left anterior carot uh, right anterior cerebral artery is decreased. There's because of the uh, because of the tumor push the 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 uh, the artery. This is the uh, from uh, lateral position. This is, uh, I take the picture uh, from external carotid artery. If uh, this is lateral projection, this is uh, uh, AP projection, we see a uh, tumor blush here. So uh, what do you think, Professor? What do you think? Uh, so I asked the, the, I asked the panelists first, maybe uh, Dr. Viasto or Think something? I still have no idea. Yeah, because because the clinician, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we we make a diagnosis from MRI. It might be swanoma from the uh, surrounding the cavernous sinus uh, due to the uh, enlargement of the uh, foramina in the skull base. It might be a mandibular uh, a nerve swanoma. But uh, the clinician think that this uh, kind of lesion is aneurysm. Although we tell the clinician this is not a, a aneurysm because there's no profoid, but they do, and uh, that is the, the result of the uh, DSA. But Tersi, do you do you think uh, what what do you think about the DSA? I think the DSA just only tumor plus because the tumor is quite uh, hypervascularized. So we see the tumor plus, but there is no aneurysm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There is no aneurysm. Uh, from MR imaging, we already know if this is not aneurysm. Yeah. From the MR angiography, we also see there is no aneurysm, just only indentation of the vessels, but yeah. no aneurysm. Yeah. And also from the MRA, this is not uh, aneurysm. Yeah, Prof. Yuyun, what do you think? Yes, yes Dr. Angre and Dr. Sri, I agree with Dr. Sri. Uh, from uh, MRI, uh, we can conclude that uh, there is no aneurysm. And also from TSA, and uh, I think from uh, this case, uh, we can diagnose aneurysm or not based on the MRI. MRI. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Angre. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Dr. Angre, Maybe. Yeah. Um, I think if uh, we saw the tumor, it's not the, uh, it's the tumor is lack of blood supply. So maybe the the central necrosis, maybe there is a, a destruction of the tumor or something we can uh, think that is this an abscess or something it is uh, it can be uh, as possibility but um i'm i'm still curious with the the starting of the tumor or the origin of the tumor because uh, it is uh, like exactly uh, in the base of the skull in the skull base i think uh, it is a very uh, challenging for us to know what is the origin of this tumor. I think. Yeah, uh, I think from the delineation of the tumor is very sharp. So uh, regular margin and also uh, I think the, uh, from, from uh, DWI there is not restricted uh, diffusion. So I think this is not an abscess, but this is a benign tumor. Uh, coming from uh, surrounding the cavernous sinus. Uh, 
So it might be a tumor coming from the nerve surrounding the uh, sinus, uh, cavernous sinus. It might be uh, third nerve, fourth nerve, sixth nerve, or, or, or uh, yeah, uh, fifth nerve. What do you think, Professor? Yeah, so one of the, again, because I trained in the last century, I hate saying that, but I like telling people how old I am. Um, I trained in the days where we would actually do neuroangio as a fellow. So I'd spent two years during neuroangio. And I think now in the US, we don't do as many neuroangios anymore. So I, you know, for the new generation of neuroradiologists, it's mostly CTs and MRs. So it was nice that you actually showed the neuroangio because it, it brought back some fun but haunting memories of being up in the middle of the night doing aneurysm workups. But I think I think there's a lot of information on the on that angio that's that's helpful. Uh, number one, um, and this is sort of a rough rule: when you did the selective ICA injection, there was no hypervascular enhancement; rather, the tumor was pushed over to the side. Yeah. So there was no flow from the ICA, which in general tells me that it's not an intraaxial tumor. So number two, when I looked at the caliber, it didn't look like the carotid artery was encased. So if there is encasement of the carotid artery, there's sort of three things that I've learned can encase the carotid artery. And those pathologies tend to be meningioma, pituitary adenomas, and metastases when they arise from the skull base. So really quickly, I didn't see that. So those pathologies that arise in those locations, I kind of moved to the side. So I don't think it's intraaxial. I don't think it's anything arising pituitary and um, then the ECA was interesting too, because when you did the ECA injection, there was a blush, but it wasn't the delayed blush that we typically see in meningiomas. Yeah. So the meningiomas um, in the United States, it's a bit of a joke and I love my mother-in-law, but we would call it the mother-in-law sign for meningiomas because the enhancement would come early and stay late and it would like no, never go away. Mm -hmm. So that was the old joke we would have with the mother-in-law yeah. signs. So I love my mother-in-law though, okay. <laughs> but um, so I didn't see the classic uh, blush for meningiomas. And I know schwannomas can have a blush. So the fact that the, the enhancement was coming from the ECA, again, tells me it's probably of extra axial origin. Um, and it is some type of tumoral enhancement, albeit not a hypervascular meningioma or something hypervascular. So I still think that sort of goes along with the schwannoma. Yep. Uh, the, uh, how about the enlargement of the uh, of foramina bro, from the ovale? Yeah, so the, the hard part I had about that one was I didn't see any extension actually going through a valley. Rather, I saw more expansion of a valley. So if I saw a tumor going through a valley and expanding it, then 100%, then that would seal the diagnosis <laughs> that this was a, a schwannoma that was predominantly involving uh, V3. Um, the other thing that I would like to see are sagittal cyst images, the heavily T2-weighted images, because if it's a trigeminal schwannoma, Sometimes they can arise either from the cisternal portion of five, they can arise from peripheral branches of V3, but that would sort of homogeneously expand for amino valley. But this one would almost look like a big ball or a, or, or a, or a, a, um, a uh, um, I'm afraid of getting my geometry, a sphere sort of arising from the floor of the middle cranial fossa. So that's why I still sort of favor, favor a, a schwannoma rising actually from the uh, trigeminal slash gasserian ganglion slash semilunar ganglion, three names for the same thing, with secondary involvement of foramen ovale because it's just adjacent to it, as opposed to something actually arising from V3. Yeah. So I will continue the picture. Uh, yeah, clinical and laboratory findings are available. Imaging findings, uh, yeah, we agree this is two more. Yeah, and the location is surrounding the uh, left cavernous sinus. The intensity is non homogeneous, mostly artistic lesion. Uh, involvement to adjacent structure, we don't see any invasion. I think this is not a malignant tumor. Uh, so uh, neurovascular involvement, like the, the, the tumor push the left internal carotid artery, and I don't see any bone involvement. Uh, so the diagnosis, uh, the cause of ophthalmopagia is uh, 
well, must be a consideration. And nerve involvement of the nerve compression. How about the uh, uh, also the enlargement of foramen ovale? So uh, I saw here the third nerve, and this is the fourth nerve, and this is the sixth nerve. So uh, the involvement in the uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the this part is not is not uh, the the sign of the involvement of uh, the third the one two three uh, nerve. So from this picture, we cannot make a conclusion whether this tumor is coming from the third nerve, fourth nerve, or sixth nerve. So uh, let me. Uh, Again, uh, show this picture. This is the involvement of the skull base. It might be uh, from the uh, uh, fifth nerve, fifth three, yeah, uh, roughly a three three nerve. Yeah, we we uh, the patient is waiting for the operation. So this is that uh, we uh, make discussion in the uh, team between neurology radiology also from uh, uh, other department like uh, uh, neurosurgery. So we are waiting for the uh, diagnosis. Okay, I will continue to the second uh, case. A 66 year old male with left headache in the area of left orbit. From physical tests, there was ophthalmopathia also like uh, the uh, previous case, laboratory finding leukocyte to uh, 20,000 and thrombocyte more than 600,000. So uh, my colleague from neurology uh, uh, <coughs> suggests this is the uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, I will show the picture. This is on February 2000. Uh, 22, there is here, I think there is a lesion surrounding the uh, uh, posterior to or, uh, left orbits to the canal and the uh, surrounding also the uh, cavernous sinus. So from this picture, any uh, comment? Maybe from panelists first. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Anggre, thank you for the opportunity. Based on the age of the patient, and then clinical finding, and then conventional MRI, I'm not sure uh, the patient, uh, the lesion, uh, eh, I think the lesion based of the characteristic is a malignant lesion, I think. But I'm not sure uh, this uh, primer tumor or secondary or metastasis tumor. This is my comment. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Yuyun. Dr. Sri, maybe uh, any comment? So I see because the laboratory, uh, uh, the leukocyte is high, the thrombocyte also high. So, yeah. Uh, what do you think that this is? Is, is it? It looks like uh, there is a thrombus in the cavernous sinus. Yeah. Dr. Riasto, any comment? Yeah, I think it's a cavernous sinus a tumor or something like a tumor that extending from cavernous sinus through the orbits to the optical canal or the, the false, the uh, orbital superior fissure. Yeah. Uh, Professor, do you, uh, what, what is your idea? Any yeah, can I, see those, can I see those images again? Yeah, I think this, this is from uh, DWI. Your from yeah. So uh, yeah. So here's my here's my approach on something like this. Um, <clears throat> so this is I mean this is a really nice case to juxtapose from what we saw before and and something that I've always been quite fascinated with. Uh, 
because when we look at the central skull base, we tend to lump <clears throat> the cavernous sinus with Meckel's cave because mm. they are very close to each other, but they're mm. distinct areas. And the Meckel's cave area is a CSF invagination, which is um, directly affiliated with the trigeminal ganglion. So patients tend to have sensory and, and, and occasionally motor defects and when something involves that. In this case, this is in a similar location, but notice how it's anterior to Meckel's cave. And so this is really involved in the anterior cavernous sinus. So back when I was a fellow, um, again, the last century, I think there's, um, I don't know if there was, I think there's a wonderful neurosurgeon on this call as well too. There was some beautiful work done by Al Roten at University of Florida where they did these micro dissections and they actually separate Meckel's cave from the cavernous sinus. So as a result, you may have an, an a abnormality involving that area, but depending on which specific area it's involving, it results in different clinical symptoms. So if you have something that is in this particular case that is involving the cavernous sinus and not involving Meckel's cave, then you can have symptoms of cavernous sinus thrombosis, the cranial nerves three, six, three, four, and six out. So in this particular case, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not yet, I would say that there's something involving the cavernous sinus, but I'm not saying that this is cavernous sinus thrombosis. And the reason why I'm not saying it's cavernous sinus thrombosis is because I need to see contrast to see whether this is enhancing. No. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is typically associated with dilatation of the superior ophthalmic vein. And I don't have any images that tells me there's actually dilatation of the superior ophthalmic vein, but I do see something that's extending from the orbital apex through the superior orbital fissure into the anterior portion of the cavernous sinus. And what really catches my eye is that when I look at the flare and the T2 weighted images, notice how the peripheral area of that lesion is low signal. See that low signal there? So when I see something like this, now I'm thinking either it could be neoplastic or it potentially could be fungal and or it could be associated with IgG4 associated disease. So when um, the other thing that it could be a pseudotumor, but again, pseudotumor, the true pseudotumor, like the Tetelosa hunt, patients typically present with much more symptoms. So in summary, <clears throat> I think that this is a lesion involving the cavernous sinus. It's giving cavernous sinus um, congestion. I don't think it's necessarily cavernous sinus thrombosis based on the imaging findings. And my differential diagnosis would, would be a mass. And right now, I don't know whether it's neoplastic. I don't know whether it's due to um, some type of chronic infection because of that peripheral low signal or whether it could be IgG4 um, associated disease or some type of that spectrum of diff some type of diffuse fibrosis or uh, fi uh, fibrous tissue. So that's, that's where I would leave it now. Okay. Thank you, Prof. I will continue the picture. Yeah. This is from other, uh, this is T1 actual, and this is the T2 in the cavernous sinus. And yeah. This is uh, from the surgical. Yeah, yeah I just want to point. I just want to point. It's very, very low signal on the sagittal T two weighted images. It seems very dense. This one. This yes. One yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. See how low signal it is. Yeah. 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 Now I will uh, continue to the contrast. So there is involvement uh, in the at the retro orbital, yeah, bro. This uh, this uh, this listen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, from panelists first, maybe any uh, comment. 
Would you mind to show a picture again, Dr. Anggrek? Okay. Last picture. Last picture, yeah. Yes. Uh, my, I see the nation. Not yet, not yet. Oh, why, 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 why? Yes, uh, I still, in my opinion, uh, this lesion is mess, I think, and and uh, not benign. I think uh, malignant lesion. But uh, how uh, the other opinion? Okay, uh, Dr. Angre, may I yeah. suggest uh, if we saw the leukocyte was high and also mm. the thrombocyte was high. Um, I think we uh, think maybe this is infection, mm. but if we see the uh, MRI, uh, we cannot uh, uh, exclude the tumor because um, it is very, very strong uh, in contrast when the right and left uh, picture already uh, shown by you. And I think, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe a uh, pseudo tumor, we can also think about um, something like a, a fungal infection, I think. Maybe it can be start from the sphenoid uh, region. If not mistaken, um, when you when you get the the coronal coronal in the the right yes, and we see the spinoid. Yeah, that's 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 right. There is something on the left spinoid. Mm. So you think that there is uh in the mucosa of the left uh. Yeah, uh, sinus. Yeah, okay. maybe from the yeah. left and right. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ramdani. Uh, how about Dr. Biasto? You uh, think something here? Dr. Biasto, you still here? Dr. Biasto? Oh. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. Okay. Uh, so I think it is a, a neoplasm. Echo, uh, according to the the picture that you showed to us, um, and how it extends along the the canal of the, the cavernous sinus or through the orbit to the apex of the orbit. So I think it's 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 a neoplasm. Uh, probably you you can. Uh, show us another another sequence that might be that might uh, show the light to us that if it is yeah. a brain tumor or an infection. I don't think that even though the the leukocyte is high, uh, he experienced any leukocyte or cytosis or thrombocytosis. I don't think that this is a vascular lesion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any comment, Prof? before I uh, continue to add the modality? Um, yeah, if you can just go back to the image, I think the, just to so, sort of summarize everything because there's a lot of information now that you presented on the imaging. Um, and also the image quality is great. Yeah, I saw you do some very thin section images to this. So um, number one, I think when you showed the, uh, if you can just go back to the axial T1's post contrast, I think you showed that the lesion was extending back into the cavernous sinus and it was diffusely enhancing. And then there was a coronal T2, there was a coronal T1 weighted images with post contrast. And that actually looked like the optic nerve was, was almost being encased or narrowed. So that tells me that whatever we're dealing has a lot of bulk to it. So it's not necessarily a soft tumor that we would see like in lymphoma, but rather there's a lot of bulk to it. And then finally, as was mentioned before, um, if you look at the CT scan, it looks like there was erosion of the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. Uh, 
So when I see those three things, my top differential diagnosis would be, is it something that's emanating from the sphenoid sinus extending into the orbital apex? So is this that chronic fungal process that we talked about before? Number two, is it possible this could be a meningioma? Because um, sometimes you can't have meningiomas involved in the orbital apex. I would probably favor meningioma more if I didn't have as much disease involved in the sphenoid sinus. But I think the patient was 66 years old as well, too. Um, male, and male so patient. Which, yeah, so by, yeah, by the way, 66 years old is not old because I'm yeah. 60. So every year, someone that's 66 gets younger and younger. So this is for me, a, a, a younger to middle-aged patient. Yeah. So when younger to middle-aged patients of this age, then I think you always have to consider in the back of your mind metastases. And then finally, I, I think you still could have lymphoma. But so I think those would be my, my top three right now. I think uh, either chronic, chronic fungal disease, disease arising with a sphenoid, meningioma, possible metastases. So that's where, that's where I would be right now. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sri, uh, any comment? Dr. Sri, before I continue to uh, next slide. Uh, can continue. Maybe we'll, I want to see your diffusion with the imaging, Dr. Akre. Yeah, uh, yeah this, this imaging uh, coming after four months. So uh, this picture, the, yeah. Like, yeah, uh, after four months, uh, the patient come again with the uh, clinical findings or clinic uh, chief complaint uh, worsen. So uh, we see here at the skull base and then continue to the uh, upper part. And we see here, you see that there's, there's uh, the, the bone have the, uh, destruction, there is bone destruction here. So I think this is not a benign tumor, but this is a malignant tumor. Uh, and this is the upper part we see here, when destruction, the tumor uh, go to anterior part to ethmoid sinus. And this is a, a bigger part at the uh, sphenoid sinus. This is at the part of the uh, posterior orbits here to the cavernous sinus. And this is the upper part. So uh, after this uh, CT scan, we suggest the clinician to continue to MRI. Yeah, this is uh, from the sagittal uh, view here, the mess. This is the cavernal sinus part, and this is the bone destruction. So we continue to MRI. This is the MRI. What we surprise is the extension to the uh, basal ganglia at the left side until uh, corona radiata, as we see here. Yeah. So, yeah, me getting confused. So what do you think? Uh, uh, Panelists, what do you think? Maybe Dr. Vyasa yes. first? Dr. Vyasa first? What do you think, Dr. Vyasa? Uh, can I see the Any action? comment? I think Professor yes. has mentioned before. <laughs> professor has mentioned before, I think. There's uh, something I... interesting in this in this case. Because it's continued from the, uh, yeah, extra-axially to intra-axially. Yeah, what do you think, Dr. Biasco? Okay, may I see the actual uh, okay. scan? Okay, actual scan. Actual, yeah, this is- Yeah, actual. I think next slide. Mm, this is thin slice, Dr. Biasco. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a thin slice. Yeah, fat set. You see, the mess is, Mm -hmm. Yeah, here and continue to uh, this part, to the upper part, the, the uh, okay. superior lead. Mm -hmm. You have no axial? Uh, yeah, next, next, next slide. So this is the 
Okay, so that's the, yeah. the tumor. Okay, uh, well, is it possible for me to see the, the axial? Uh, axial. Uh, yep, this is the... Uh... Yeah, I think this is the answer. Because it's, it's typical on the uh, DWI. The tumor is restricted on uh, DWI. So we see here. Mm -hmm. Yep. You see that? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. This is after contrast injection at the right side. Highly contrast injection, non homogeneously. But in the basal ganglia, not so uh, high uh, enhancement. So let us discuss. Okay. It yeah. Like a... Dr. Sri smiles. <laughs> something, <laughs> got something. Yeah. something like that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think it yeah, is more than 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 more than 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 something infection, I, I think. Not not infection. too more exactly. Mm. Yeah, maybe a fungal fungal infection that can uh, increase to the in, uh, intracranial infection. Although this is a bone destruction like this? Yes. Yes, I think okay. so. Okay. Of you, you? Yeah, Dr. Angre. Uh, from the last picture, I think uh, I conclude that uh, there is mass, yeah, uh, and malignant characterized extra axial mass uh, infiltrate to the intraaxial. So my diagnosis is uh, malignant mass. I think. Doctor Sri. I think maybe this is all a metastatic process to the angle. Yeah. yeah. Professor Ress? Yeah, yeah, I think when I was looking at this again, it went through a little fast, but I, what this is, when I looked at it, I think it's a, some type of angioinvasive process. So there's something called Occam's razor. So Occam's razor is, do you lump or do you split? So you have this expanding process that's resulting in bone destruction involving the orbital apex and the cavernous sinus. And then all of a sudden you develop this abnormality involved in the left basal ganglia. So the issue is, is the basal ganglia part of that same disease process or is a result of that disease process? So it seems like the lesion involved in the left basal ganglia was an infarct, that it looks like this lesion may have gone to the uh, encased, and I thought I saw some images where the internal carotid artery was being encased. Um, and so is it possible that this thing kind of grew up along the internal carotid artery, went to the A1 and the M1 segments, and then clipped off the lenticular striates, and that gave you the basal ganglial in infarct. Yeah. So I think whatever this is, is it's, it's an angioinvasive process. And so, as I mentioned before, when I think of tumors that involve the carotid artery that can, if untreated, can in case the carotid artery, I think of metastases. It's growing a little too fast for a meningioma. Um, lymphoma in general doesn't give you that type of uh, bone erosion, but um, I guess it's possible. But I have seen cases of chronic fungal infections too um, that can grow, be angioinvasive and eventually clip off the uh, lenticular striates and then result in uh, a infarct because of that um, angioinvasiveness. Yeah, we do the uh, MR angiography after contrast injection, Prof. So I will show you. This is the uh, T2 flare. Uh, can I ask you something, Professor? Why, why uh, after contrast injection in the uh, basal ganglia is not uh, enhanced? Is it Why is, I'm sorry, were you asking me or somebody else? Yeah, 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 you. you. After, because after contrast injection is not uh, uh, highly contrast injection in the basal ganglia. I, I thought it did enhance when you just went past the, the left. I thought there was per, uh, ring enhancement. Mm, yeah, ring enhancement, yeah. 
Yeah. So why is the rim in here? Why is the rim? Why is the rim in here? Yeah. Sorry, because I see here from uh, like you uh, uh, tell us before in the in the, your lecture, we do in the T one. Is it? We see here a massive tumor at the skull base. Is it? This one. It means uh, it, it can infection like this. I don't think. Is this, is this a tumor? Yeah, I mean, it looks like it. It looks like a tumor on on that mm -hmm. image. That's why I want to see more images. Uh, again, after contrast injection. This part is, yeah, highly contrast enhancement. I think uh, there's involvement also in the masticator space. Is it? Yeah, so I think I think the masticator space involvement may be denervation atrophy because it looks like it's going back into the left um, into the left uh, Meckel's cave. So sometimes mm -hmm. if you see robust enhancement involved in the masticator space in a long-standing skull-based tumor, sometimes mm -hmm. that's due to denervation atrophy, just like you're seeing that angioinvasiveness. Okay. Yeah. This is the uh, MR angiography uh, after contrast injection for. This is the lesion here, located. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, if we compare this one, uh, VS case two, I think uh, first case is B9 tumor because location, extra Asia, DW unrestricted, sharp margin, on vision to adjacent structures, Intensity in homogeneous, kistic, and uh, also hemorrhage. Enhancement only at the solid part, uh, at the skull base, and last of paramin ovale. And the second case, a location extra and intraaxially, DWI restricted, irregular margin, invasion to adjacent structure, the NCT, solid tumor, and enhancement strong, skull base destruction. Yeah, I think. Uh, this is the last slide from me because uh, time is up now. Is it, uh, yeah, what, what is your comment, Dr. Sri? Dr. Sri, comment from the two of the case. Yes, I think this is a good case. Uh, and also you can make a differentiation between benign and malignant mass for this lesion. And then what we see, uh, also, when you see the age of the patient, this is young patient, and also we are versus with the old patient. So when you see in this old patient, and you see there is a metastatic process, and with malignancy in the scalp is mass, and then in young patient, in this patient, this is a well defined mass in the central scalp is that we see this is a like swadoma. So I think this is a good case. Okay. Prof. Yuyut? Yes, uh, Dr. Anggrek, uh, your case is uh, very good. Yeah? It's difficult uh, to us to differentiate uh, benign and malignant tumor uh, in skull base. Maybe, uh, can I, may I uh, have uh, asking to Prof. Sures? Prof. Sures, uh, your uh, presentation is very clear and informative. But uh, would you mind to give us some take home message, maybe? Yeah? Uh, how to distinguish be between benign and malignant lesion, like uh, Dr. Angre case? Uh, we know that uh, the preferred uh, modality to diagnose skull based tumor is MRE or uh, CT. If we use CT scan, um, what the technique should we perform? And if we use uh, MRI, what the technique or sequence uh, should be done? 
I think uh, my ask you to <laughs> Prof Suarez. Thank you, Prof. Uh, sure. So to answer your first question, um, how do you separate benign versus malignant? The challenge that you run into is that if you have a, an area like um, the sinuses, or as, as we saw here, if something arises in a cavity and, and you have an early tumor, you really can't tell the difference <clears throat> between a benign and a malignant lesion. And you can do ADC maps, but the challenge is, is that if the ADC maps aren't really good quality, um, and you have small lesions, I just don't believe the data is reliable enough. But <clears throat> once you end up having, um, once the tumor actually starts to extend out or push the walls of the cavity when it's in, that actually gives you more information. So from a CT standpoint, you have to look at that bone erosion. So if there's really, real, let me give you, I'll give you some examples because this was just at a seminar I did not too long, actually two weeks ago. If you have a mass involved in a bony cavity and you see the aggressive bony destruction, just like was shown earlier today, that tells you you're dealing with a malignant process because that aggressive bony destruction. If you see something that is slowly expanding the bone, that is more consistent with the benign process. But having said that, you can also have slow growing malignancies like adenoid cystic carcinoma that can arise in the skull base or the sinuses that can still slowly expand and still erode the bone, but not give you that aggressive bone expansion. So the bottom line is, is that I feel comfortable at one end or the other. If something gives you aggressive bone erosion, it's malignant. If something gives you slow bone expansion, that's probably benign. But when you start seeing early cortical erosion, that still could be a malignant process, but some malignant processes really aren't, aren't, aren't rapidly growing. So I hope I explained that to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Dr. Rondoni, last. Uh, uh, thank yeah, you, I think it is very, very interesting cases, but um, actually uh, as an ecologist, I think uh, you should uh, give us more uh, data such as like uh, maybe you have a uh, a PET scan or something else that can show if we talk about the metastatic process, we have to um, to think uh, whether the original tumor of the, yeah, the primary condition. tumor. Yeah. Yes. So if we talk about the metastatic, but without we think about the origin of the real tumor, I think uh, this, we, we cannot think separately like that. So if we uh, think this is uh, only the data like uh, Dr. Angre already shown. So we think that uh, I think the primer, primer site of the tumor is on that region. But I think it's very challenging and uh, it is very, very nice to discuss in this evening and this morning. Thank you, Dr. Angre. Thank you, Dr. Angre. Dr. Yasa, any comment? Yeah, actually, I, I have uh, two questions for uh, Professor Suresh. I'm sorry, it's it's been a late, a late night here, <clears throat> but uh, as a surgeon, uh, I'm an, a neurosurgeon, would it be possible for us to differentiate uh, between the tumor originating from the bone that I usually uh, receive the patients with a, a big tumor on the skull base and we, we didn't know if uh, it is originated from the bone itself, or uh, the tumor is coming from the soft tissue and uh, disrupting uh, the bone. Because it is important for us, for the neurosurgeon, as we need to, to plan uh, how to close the, or how to reconstruct the skull base with uh, something like a titanium mass or uh, artificial uh, bone. So if the tumor is coming from the bone, then it will be easy usually that uh, the tumor will uh, grow again and then uh, it will disrupt our, our skull piece uh, that we reconstruct. So uh, it is difficult for us to, to do another surgery for, uh, with the reconstructed uh, skull piece. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the first uh, question. And the second question is, it is a merely a technical question actually, uh, to help us uh, manage our 
uh, the speed of our patient in diagnostic uh, our patients. I read that uh, there is an ultra fast MRI that can be done in one minute. So uh, the patient don't have to stay along like 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, in the MRI. Well, um, besides of that, uh, the patient, who, those who who need a uh, contrast agent, but uh, would it be possible for us, uh, for a neurosurgeon to get an ultrafast MRI? And would it be possible for, for an ultrafast MRI uh, to be uh, employed in our hospital? Thank you, Prof. Suresh. Uh, yeah, sure, thanks for, and thanks for educating me on the uh, skull-based areas. So the answer is, yeah, it can help. And I'll give you, um, again, there's an old saying by Will Rogers, an American philosopher that says, Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So um, unfortunately I have a lot of experience because I've had some bad judgment and things. So what I've done is I, I can reflect back on my last 30 years of doing this. Um, and, and I've never been asked this question before but I can reflect back and give you some thoughts on this regarding lesions that are arising when the bone or outside of the bone. Um, here's what I've learned over the past. So the four most likely tumors to involve the skull base that are actually arising within the bone or of cartilaginous or bony origin tend to be osteosarcomas, chondrosarcomas, um, metastases, meningiomas, and I should say the other ones are chordomas and plasmacytomas and metastases. So basically there's seven things that typically arise from the bone. So if I'm looking at an MRI scan and where I often have a challenge is are meningiomas actually intraosseous meningiomas that are expanding the greater wing of the sphenoid or is there secondary involvement of, of the bone from a meningioma arising from the dura? So on MRI, what I do is I look for whether or not the intramedullary space, the diploe of the greater wing of the sphenoid or the lesser wing is actually expanded. So I actually look for expansion. And if I see a, what I think is either meningioma or metastasis that's expanding the diploe on MR, then that tells me it's arising within the bone itself. And there's secondary involvement of the dura. On CT, what I look for, in CT, we don't get as good a view as the diploe, but I think plasma cytomas are pretty easy to show that they're arising within the climate. So I think that's pretty straightforward. And in general, I think, metastatic deposits within the bone are relatively easy. But if I'm trying to decide whether I'm looking at a chondrosarcoma or, or an osteosarcoma, what I do is I look for those calcifications. If I see dystrophic calcifications that are directly abutting the bone or an adjacent soft tissue next to the bone that has the dystrophic calcifications, then that leads to me to believe that the osteosarcoma or the chondrosarcoma is actually arising from the skull base as opposed to being extra osseous. Because as you know, sometimes we can have extra osseous osteosarcomas or, chondro or chondrosarcomas. Yeah. So those are two tricks I've learned, expansion, the diploe on MR, and then on CT for those weird ones that can arise from the skull base is I look for dystrophic or expansile calcifications from the skull base. Regarding the ultra fast MR, there are different ways to approach this. So you do have some MRs that have very, very high gradient strengths, especially 3T magnets with special software where you can do very quote unquote ultra fast MRs. And it really depends on your definition of an ultra fast MR. Are you looking at one specific sequence? Because basically for kids that are shunted, pediatric kids that are shunted, we can do a very, very fast T2 weighted images in like 30 or 40 seconds. But if you're looking at define an ultra fast MR with multiple sequences that can all be performed in a couple of minutes, then that requires a, a strong magnet with strong gradients with the proper software. So that really would require an upgrade. So the answer is yes, you can do it. And I think at a university like yours, where you're clearly one of the top universities um, in the region, if not the world, um, I think. Um, it would be great to get the team together, decide um, what type of magnet you want, um, what the goals are and what you define as really ultra fast and what information you hope to achieve uh, when you create a protocol, quote unquote, an ultra fast uh, MR protocol. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. For
Ya, Dr. Sri, finish. Yes, okay. Thank you, Dr. Andreni, <laughs> for your for your lecture. Yeah, uh, for your discussion also is very nice. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sures, Dr. Doni, and Dr. Wihasto, and Prof. Yuyun, Dr. Wika. Okay. You want to close? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. 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 Well, it has come to the end of the today's webinar, Professor Sures. Thank you. And there is some some take home message that uh, we have to always remember that imaging anatomy is, is important, yeah, Prof. Suresh. And then uh, we have to give some information for clinician about the specific area, uh, about the intraorbital extension, intracranial involvement, carotid artery engagement. Yeah. And then uh, please remember about mimics and do not touch lesion. And doctor, from Dr. Sri, uh, please use first conventional and structural MRI. Uh, this is very important and to make interpretation. And after that, we continue with advanced MRI. Uh, and then from Dr. Angre, uh, we have to evaluate from CT or MRI about the lesion characteristic. And then we can see also about the benign or malignant lesion from the involvement. So uh, as the last agenda unfold, uh, we have reached the end of our webinar agenda today. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank to entity of STEAM cases for attending and supporting this event. Professor Sures, Dr. Ramdoni, Prof. Yuyun, Dr. Angre, Dr. Sri, Dr. Wihasto, and for all of the committee, thank you for your time and be safe and be healthy. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Dr. Doni. Thank you, Rosuras. Thank you very much. See you again, Prof. See you in the next occasion, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Suresh. We'll keep in touch. We'll keep in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening. Good night. Good morning. You say good night, Prof. Here. Yeah, for Prof. Suresh, have a good time. Activity. Have a good day for you. Yeah, good day as we sleep now. <laughs> we <can just> sleep. <laughs> good night and sweet dreams. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye, -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.